Excellent. So thanks everybody for joining us uh, for the fourth workshop. Uh, today we're going to be talking about risk scaling. We're going to bring us in through a, a safety message, uh, as I usually do, just to give us some time, give folks a time to come in. I made a last minute decision to change the safety message because there was a picture of the guy behind the WebEx screen that I just wasn't ready to talk about yet. Uh, and maybe uh, we'll talk about that in a later workshop. But uh, for now, you only get to see my face. Um, so, and you can see it though, because it got sent out to the service list. So if you're really curious, you can go and see it. But today we're gonna talk about the emergency alert system uh, and wireless uh, emergency alert. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, I just found out this morning that actually at 11.20 uh, Pacific time today, uh, FEMA is going to conduct a nationwide test of the emergency alert system and wireless emergency alert. And so there's going to be a nationwide test. Uh, it's going to include like about one minute interruptions of TV and radio broadcasts. And then they're also uh, going to include a broadcast for 30 minutes uh, from cell phone towers, and it's going to result in an alert on your phone. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that you're probably going to get that uh, at 11.20 today in the middle of our meeting. Uh, these nationwide tests are important because the EAS and the WEA provide effective means of warning the public about emergencies. The system is often used at the regional level too, um, and we use it to inform the public of severe weather, amber alerts, and other civil emergency emergencies. Um, finally, just to note that this is, in fact, the seventh nationwide test of these paired systems, so it's quite common, actually. Um, I will say that uh, these types of tests, in my personal experience, are not that disruptive. A far more unnerving test uh, were the air raid sirens that I used to experience over Oslo when I was living there. So, and I learned about that test the first time the hard way. Nobody told me that they were doing that. It was very disturbing. Um, okay, great. So uh, this meeting is going to be recorded, uh, as has been noted. One or more decision makers may be present during the meeting, but no decisions will be taken. Um, how about we do a quick roll call? Um, so if a pg and &E, is pg and &E on the line? Uh, yes, present. Welcome, Vincent. And I see that your video is coming in pretty good. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, turn the utility reform now. I'm here. Sorry, I'm I'm on a important call. Sorry, I'll be no back. Worries. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody from Public Advocates Office? Yes, Anna Yang is here. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, anyone from Semper Companies? Or Natty? Yes, we're on the call. Great. Anybody from uh, Southern California, Edison? Yes, we have representatives on the call as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, anyone from Mussy Grade Road Alliance? Okay. Uh, anyone from Protect Our Communities Foundation? Yep. John Webster here for PCF. Okay, great. Uh, is there anybody from Energy Producers and Users Coalition and Indicated Shippers? No? Thought I heard uh, somebody come off mute, but maybe not. Anybody from Utility Consumers Action Network? Yeah, hi, uh, Eric Wojcik here. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Okay, Sounds thanks. good. Yeah. Uh, is there any other uh, group or individual that would like to be uh, represented? Uh, please let us know. Okay. If anybody comes in late, uh, you can feel free to, or if you see anybody come in late, uh, maybe have them send a little message in the chat just to let, make sure that they're represented. So our agenda. Uh, it's going to be relatively fixed, mainly to just accommodate the presenters and uh, stakeholders' schedules. Um, you know, flexibility is uh, allowed only if there's consensus, but uh, I'm assuming that we're going to use up all of the time uh, until we get to the 1230 mark. And as you've seen, I've, I've extended us out to 1230. Of course, uh, through consensus, we will also discuss whether at the end of the, the presentation, whether or not we need, or actually the end of the workshop, whether we need to uh, use the optional uh, uh, time uh, for Friday uh, to have uh, continued discussion on this topic. So um, we will come back to that uh, towards the close of this workshop. Um, and then uh, yeah, 
Uh, I'll just try to remind myself to, to save uh, the chat when we finish. Um, but uh, here's a, I just wanted to go over a few uh, participation rules that we have. If you have any IT related issues during the, the uh, workshop, please reach out to Jacob. Uh, Jacob Wilman, and I just put his uh, email address inside the chat so you can have that. Uh, attendees have the ability to mute and unmute themselves. Uh, attendees, we do ask that everybody stay muted except during the Q&A period. Um, during the presentation portion of this, uh, of each session of each presentation, uh, attendees can enter questions into the chat box. Uh, make sure to address it to everyone uh, and not just to me so that everyone has a chance to see your, your question. Uh, we'll do our best to occasionally interrupt a presenter if there's any clarifying questions, but non clarifying questions, we would like to hold uh, until the discussion period. Um, there may be some time after you know, each of the presentations to ask a couple clarifying questions, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a moment uh, after a break to come back and have some non clarifying questions for each of the presenters. And then uh, we have uh, the commission has actually a set of questions, uh, primarily for for PG and E that we'll go over uh, in the discussion period. And then, uh, if there's not enough time to respond to all chat box questions during the workshop, SPD will collect uh, answers to those questions and then circulate them to the service list after. Uh, during the discussion, please use the hand raise function to speak. And I will do my best to call on you in the order that they that you appear. And uh, after the question is asked, I would really appreciate it if you could lower your hand. So uh, I think that's uh, it for me for right now. Um, let's hand it over to uh, Commissioner Reynolds' office. Uh, I believe uh, Jake McDermott is going to give us just a, a brief uh, few words to to send it, start us off. Go ahead, Jake. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. Uh, you might remember me from our last workshop on climate change. My name is Jake McDermott, and I'm one of Commissioner Reynolds' advisors that's assigned um, to the RDF for SMAP 2 proceeding. Commissioner Reynolds apologizes as he's not able to attend today's workshop. I'd like to thank staff for their work on setting up this workshop, but I'd like to thank TURN and PGE for their um, position papers and proposals that they have uh, provided. And I'd like to thank the uh, rest of the interveners for their attendance and participation today. To kick things off, um, we're here to talk about risk scaling and what it means within the RDF. Risk scaling is, in short, a way for us to understand an organization's perception of risks and critically how they may respond to these risks when making decisions. Risk scaling can be represented by a function and different functions also provide us with qualitative labels that we can apply to these risk perceptions. These labels are all probably quite familiar to us and include things like risk averse, risk neutral, or even risk seeking. As the workshop agenda notes, we know that the utilities apply a risk scaling function, but that we've never required a specific type of function. That is to say that the IOUs select a function of their own choosing and that then funnels into their decision making about how best to manage and mitigate risks. This has enormous implications for the ultimate mitigations that the IOUs select to implement. For today, our office is keenly interested in the application of these functions and how they relate to decision making on which mitigations to pursue. Thinking back to our scoping memo, we want to understand what are the best practices for implementing risk scaling and if there are any other requirements that we should be placing on their application. We'd like parties to really grapple with this idea of whose preferences are being accounted for when using these functions and how does that then relate and connect back to which mitigations are ultimately proposed and implemented. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Eddie. That was excellent, Jake. Thank you so much. Uh, in a way, Jake kind of stole a little bit of my thunder for uh, unveiling our discussion today. That was perfect. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of ramping through our, our timeline here. We're already on workshop number four. Um, you know, just a heads up that we do have another workshop on October 25th. I can come back to that at the end. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about risk scaling. And so, 
you know, Jake really has uh, highlighted a lot of the, the topics uh, that, uh, you know, the purpose of, of this workshop. Um, I think the only thing that I would add, uh, you know, is, is just that um, we're hoping to get feedback on, on the benefits and costs or any uh, additional revisions that, um, you know, would be related to uh, risk scaling or the adoption of minimal requirements regarding the risk scaling function. And so I think that was a, a really great way to, to start us off. I think I'm actually going to shift us directly into the presentations. Um, and I believe we're going to first start with, I should have actually mentioned that in the agenda, we're going to start with um, the presentation from TURN. Um, and then directly after that, we'll move into a presentation from PG&E. Uh, and then we'll have a quick break and then go into a, a general discussion after that. So, um, yeah, if the folks from TURN are prepared, we'd be happy to let you guys start. Cool. All right. I see Katie's giving us a thumbs up. So take it away, Katie. I will take it away. Um, thank you uh, to staff for giving us the opportunity to give this presentation today. Um, TURN's position on risk scaling or risk attitude um, has not changed you know, throughout this proceeding. And so this is really our um, us trying to give additional context and some suggestions for how we can um, incorporate TURN's position in, into the RDF. Um, that I'd like to start by acknowledging my position paper relied on the risk attitude language. Um, our presentation today and our updated uh, position paper will uh, use the risk scaling language that we've um, transferred to. Um, and I also wanted to note that neither Chuck, uh, Dr. Feinstein, or myself will be able to attend on Friday if we do go till Friday. So if you have questions specific to our presentation, um, we uh, are here today to field them. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, I'm going to kind of fly through these initial ones because I, I think we, we all know the basics. Um, risk scaling, um, is, you know, a way of reflecting our risk attitude. Um, the 3 risk attitudes are risk averse, risk neutral and risk seeking. Um, and I would just like to note from the outset that turn does not support the adoption of a risk seeking or, um, concave. Uh, risk scaling function um, within the, the confines of the RDF. Um, and so to the extent we're discussing choice, it's and an, um, an op the opportunity to choose between a risk scaling function from here on out, we're really referring to um, a linear versus a convex scaling function because we believe that those are the more appropriate um, ones to be discussed. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide. Um, as put in the SPD roadmap, uh, roadmap on page two, risk scaling represents a stakeholder's willingness to accept or avoid risk when making decisions and can be described as linear, convex, or concave. Um, we would take that a step further and highlight that the risk scaling function can be used to measure and reflect the willingness to accept uncertainty when making choices about mitigations and that Risk aversion shouldn't be confused with aversion to bad outcomes. A linear scaling function um, also shows that there is an aversion to bad outcomes. It's just reflecting it a bit differently. Uh, and to talk a little more, we'll go to the next slide about how these risk attitudes and the choice of the linear scaling function um, can be demonstrated. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Chuck to talk about um, show a simple mathematical example of it. Thanks, Katie. What you see in front of you is a probability tree. Um, the tree is supposed to represent or can be used to represent an uncertain situation. In this uncertain situation, you toss a fair coin. Um, the fact that the coin is fair means that the probability it lands on heads is 50%, the probability it lands on tails is 50%. And the way this gamble is structured, if it lands on heads, you have to pay $100. If it lands on tails, you have to pay nothing. So on the next slide, we can use this probability tree to demonstrate a person's attitude towards risk. Um, you have this gamble, so you either pay $100 or nothing, and someone offers you the chance to avoid the gamble. Why would you avoid the gamble? Well, you avoid the gamble because you don't want to pay $100. 
the expected value of the gamble is a mathematical um, uh, a pro, uh, a consequence of the probability tree. The expected value of a gamble is found by multiplying probabilities by outcomes and adding up the result. So the expected value in this case is 0.5 times $100 plus 0.5 times $0. Maybe I can have the previous slide. Is that possible? Thank you. 0.5 times $100 plus 0.5 times $0. That gives you the expected value of this gamble is $50. So, in the next slide, what I'm asking is how would a person respond to an offer to avoid this gamble? Um, how much would you pay as an individual to avoid the gamble? If you are risk neutral, then you would pay $50. If you're risk averse, you'd pay more than $50 because you don't like the uncertainty associated with losing $100. If you're risk seeking, you would pay less than $50 because you believe that the world uh, is such that you're willing to accept this risk in the hope that you would get no dollars as a consequence. And the issue of risk aversion, as Katie said, we're not thinking of risk seeking here. The issue of risk aversion is very simple. Risk aversion means that an individual decision maker is unwilling to accept a fair bet, unwilling to pay $50 to avoid this gamble. And you can see very simply that this is a, an illustration of something that has um, practical implementation in a gambling casino. Um, it's exactly what happens when you go up to a casino and bet 50-50 on something like a roulette wheel, assuming that the two green cells are removed. So we set up the idea of of uh, of risk attitude and um, and uh, risk neutrality in particular in the context of a gamble. Bottom line, a risk neutral person is willing to pay fifty dollars to avoid this gamble, but no more. Certainly willing to pay less. A risk averse person is willing to pay more than fifty dollars to avoid this gamble. Katie, I think the next slide was one that. Um, we're going to discuss. Yep. Um, the planning questions for this proceeding ask um, the considerations and um, the principles that uh, should inform our, our discussion of scaling functions. And I'm going to kind of talk about these together, but the thing that we would remind everyone is that we are facing an affordability crisis and we're going to have to make difficult decisions. And so we should be looking at information that is presented without bias and transparent, transparently. Um, the RDF is used in the ramp and, you know, it's um, scoring has also been presented in the GRC as um, a justification and explanation um, for spending on different projects. And for that information to be most helpful to the commission, it is our belief that it should be presented in a risk neutral um, or linear scaling, using a risk neutral risk attitude or a linear scaling function. Um, and so for for purposes of this proceeding, our, um, our, our stance has evolved a little bit and that we you know, do think that the RDF should be updated to include a requirement that a linear scaling function be presented in the um, data provided by the utility as a minimum requirement. And then if um, the utility wants to provide the results of their um, risk averse um, scaling function as well, uh, that would be provided in addition to uh, the information presented using the linear scaling function. Um, and we'll present that that language later in the pre, uh, presentation. Um, if we want to go to the next slide. So the question was raised by the commissioner's office this morning, um, and I think this is a question that's really central to turns position is um, that risk attitude or the scaling function chosen should reflect the ratepayer interest. Um, that's whose um, preferences should be represented in the scaling function. Uh, the level four report on RSE that was um, submitted and included in the record of this proceeding during the last phase 
includes a language, the SMAP process is not explicit about whose preferences the MAVF should represent. Although by assigning MAVF construction to the utilities, it might be taken to imply that each MAVF should represent the preferences of the utility that developed it. And I just wanted to highlight that TURN um, does not agree with that latter statement that there is an implication that the MAVF should represent the preferences of the utility that developed it. Um, we believe that the scaling function should reflect the preferences of the people of California or the ratepayers of the utility. Um, they're the ones that are paying for the work of the utility and they are the ones that are most impacted by the work of the utility. Uh, we wanna go to the next slide. Um, so if we're reflecting the preferences of ratepayers, then we you know, have to identify what their preferences are. And so if we're thinking about this in terms of, it is a question about the approach to uncertainty. Um, some rate payers will agree that it's worthwhile to spend more money to avoid bad outcomes, but um, other rate payers and even those same rate payers may not be willing to spend beyond what would be suggested by the expected value to avoid the bad impact or bad outcome. And it's going to be really difficult to determine what the ratepayer attitude towards uncertainty is. It's a large, it's a diverse group. They have different attitudes. They have different preferences. They have different issues that they are most concerned about. Um, and so TURN suggests that adopting a risk neutral approach is most likely to balance the variety of risk attitudes um, represented by um, rate, you know, utility ratepayers or Californians. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? Another reason why um, we uh, believe that a linear scaling function is um, the best minimum requirement is that if you rely on a um, risk averse scaling function that you're gonna introduce some bias. And that um, if you're introducing bias, you're gonna be able to justify higher mitigation costs without actually changing you know, the impact of what the mitigation can do. Um, and uh, Dr. Feinstein is going to walk us through another mathematical example to demonstrate um, how uh, bias is introduced by um, a convex scaling function. In the earlier example, we just uh, talked about there was a 50-50 gamble, so you can either lose $100 or lose nothing. On the next slide, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, on the next slide, I remind you that the expected value of this risky situation is $50. And that's the risk neutral, what is called the certain equivalent. So if you look at a gamble like this, you would be willing to pay if you're risk neutral $50 to avoid it. Now, suppose there's a risk mitigation alternative. Suppose that that risk mitigation alternative uh, reduces the probability of getting heads from 0.5 to 0.49. Um, the risk reduction is then found by taking the expected value of the two different situations, which involves taking the probability 0.5, subtracting the probability 0.49, leaving a net redu reduction in likelihood of 1% times $100. That's worth a dollar. Um, so the risk neutral decision maker would look at this and say, well, if I could get the probability of heads to go down from 0.5 to 0.49, then that's worth a dollar to me, and that's all I'm willing to pay. And if I have to pay more than that, I won't pay it because it isn't worth it. And I'll take the original gamble. Thank you very much. Now, what happens if we go to a risk averse scaling function? Again, I'm trying to illustrate this in the simplest possible way we can just about do the arithmetic in our heads. Consider a risk averse scaling function that squares the costs. That's convex function. The word convex means that if you draw a picture of the graph, it smiles or it holds water. So uh, cost, square the cost is an example of a convex or risk averse scaling function. On the next slide, I show what that means. So instead of a cost of $100, the square of the cost is 10,000 units. Instead of a cost of $0, the square of the cost is zero units. Under risk aversion then, the expected consequences 
is equal to 0.5 times 10,000 plus 0.5 times zero or 5,000. Now that's 5,000 watt. Well, that's 5,000 scaled units. To express what that is in terms of dollars, you have to take the square root of it. The square root of 5,000 square units is $70.71. And so that's the certainty equivalent of this gamble under risk aversion, which means that if an individual had the utility function or the scaling function square the cost, that individual would be willing to pay up to $70.71 to avoid this gamble. The risk neutral person would not be willing to pay more than $50. Now, it's interesting to ask, in addition to that, what's the value of the mitigation? The value of the mitigation can be found by comparing this um, uh, uncertain situation with probability 0.5 and probability 0.5 to the uncertain situation with probability 0.49 and probability 0.51. The risk reduction then is 0.01 times 10,000 units. That's 100 units. That means that the dollar value of the risk reduction is the square root of 100 units or $10. But I remind you that we computed the risk neutral value of the risk reduction as $1. So if you add risk aversion, what happens is that the certainty equivalent in terms of dollars of the gamble goes up and the justified value in terms of dollars of the mitigation also goes up. That happens uniformly when you move from risk neutrality to risk uh, aversion. And that's the bias that we would like to avoid because it makes apparently the cost or dollar value of the mitigation greater than it otherwise would be. Katie, I think the next slide is yep. one that you wanted to discuss. Yep. Um, I'm just going to introduce the idea and then I'm going to hand it back to you for our, our, our math. But um, in addition to bias, um, we think that uh, risk aversion or a convex scaling function can lead to illogical results. Um, it, it boils down to term believes that expected fatalities should be treated similarly. Um, a fatality is not less valuable to prevent just because it comes from a smaller event. Um, however, using a convex scaling function that that may be the result. Um, and so for that reason, because of this potential for illogical events, we think that a linear scaling function um, is is better suited um, for for this application. And um, we're going to go to the next slide. And again, um, Dr. Feinstein is going to take us through a mathematical example. All right, this is a this is a little complicated. Um, let's consider you have two events. And event one, risk event one, occurs one is expected to occur one time per year. When the event occurs, there are 11 fatalities. If the event doesn't occur, there are zero fatalities. You could be uncertain about the 11 if you like, but that's the number of fatalities that you expect to see, particularly in this example. Let's treat it as deterministic. Uh, if event two occurs, which occurs about 10 times, it occurs 10 times a year, there's one fatality if the risk event occurs and no fatalities if it doesn't. Now you have two mitigations. Mitigation A reduces the first event's fatalities by one from 11 to 10. Mitigation B reduces event two's fatalities also by one from one to zero. Now, if you impose a risk averse utility function, what happens is that mitigation A will be found to be more valuable, and I will demonstrate this in a moment, mitigation A will be more valuable than mitigation B, despite the fact that mitigation A only reduces the expected fatalities by one per year. In other words, the occurrence, one per year, reduction in fatalities from 11 to 10, one fatality, expected reduction in fatalities, one per year. But mitigation B reduces the fatalities by 10 per year. 
because event A occurs 10 times per year, if mitigation B is implemented, the number of fatalities goes from one to zero. That means mitigation B has the effect of reducing the number of fatalities by 10. So there's a 10 to one benefit in this scenario between um, B compared with A. But in the next slide, I show what happens if we impose risk aversion. In risk aversion, and again, just for illustration, let's use the quadratic function. Um, in the first mitigation, mitigation A, you'll see in this diagram, once again, I show a probability tree. If the event E1 occurs, which happens with probability E1, then the fatalities are 11. If the mitigation is imposed, the fatalities are 10. So the number of fatalities goes from 11 to 10. If the event of, if the event E1 doesn't occur, and that's what that symbol means on the lower branch of this probability tree, that occurs with probability one minus P of E1, the fatalities is zero. And, the, and, and so the event has the same structure as the, this lottery rather, has the same structure as the 100 zero gamble we talked about before. Now, if we impose a quadratic utility function or quadratic scaling function, the 11 becomes 121, 10 becomes 100, the scaled units that we decrease the consequences by is 121 minus 100. And that means that the risk reduction is the probability of the event occurring, or in this case, the expected number of occurrences, one per year times 21. So that's 21 per year. And that's the way we would measure the risk reduction in terms of the risk averse scaling function. So we have 21 scaled units per year for mitigation A. Next slide shows what happens to mitigation B. Mitigation B, remember, occurs 10 times per year. The fatalities, if the event occurs, will go from one to zero if mitigation B is implemented. Squared fatalities, well, that's also one to zero. Square one is one. And so the risk reduction is 10 per year times the reduction in scaled units, which is one minus zero, that's 10 per year. So as I said before, mitigation A is preferred to mitigation B because of risk aversion. But mitigation B is preferred to mitigation A because of the reduction in the expected number of fatalities. And it seems to me that it is illogical to prefer a mitigation that results in fewer avoided fatalities. And the, the problem, the issue, the, the, the reason for this is because of risk aversion. If risk aversion were not here, this would not happen. I think, Katie, the next slide is the one that, yeah, yeah. oh. Um, and yeah, and I, this slide we're not really gonna go too deeply into. I just wanted to highlight that, um, we have previously attached to, I believe it was our comments on the post pre hearing comments, pre hearing conference comments. We attached um, Dr. Lesser's um, testimony from the GRC where it reflected that um, this, this type of illogical results had occurred. Um, so I would direct anyone that wants to read that testimony to our post pre hearing conference comments. Um, if we'd like to go to the next slide. Um, so going back to um, generally a, a request that there be a minimum requirement established uh, for a linear scaling function. We believe that in addition to, um, you know, reducing the bias, um, preventing illogical results, reflecting rate pair preferences, that a linear scaling function is more transparent. Um, with a linear scaling function, you have the information in front of you. You're not adding a scaling function to the results that um, we, it's not an additional layer that kind of obscures the, the results. Um, it's easier to modify. Again, we can, with a linear scaling function, we're able to trace changes to inputs or assumptions um, more easily. Um, checking it is more straightforward. Um, and then, you know, I think when you're relying on a linear scaling function, we're not introducing bias and having to justify why that bias is necessarily 
um, appropriate in this situation. Um, we're not requiring that defense of um, preferences to spend beyond the expected value. So for that reason, um, TURN recommends that the commission adopt the linear scaling function as a minimum requirement. Um, and you know, provided that the utility offers the linear um, scaling function results, TURN is not opposed to the utility. Also providing results from a convex scaling function. This is similar to how line 24 of the RDF already operates, where the utility is required to present the expected value and can present an alternative. And interveners to a proceeding you know, reserve the right to sort of um, uh, dig into either of them and take a position on either of them. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, this is our proposed changes to the RDF language. Um, and uh, I based these changes and the language that was used um, on the language of line 24. And so um, that should reflect sort of a similar um, minimum requirement with option for additional information provided. Uh, and then to the next slide, um, just wanted to take a few minutes to respond to some of the other planning questions that were put out in advance of the workshop. Um, question seven asked, can risk scaling functions incorporate ESJ concerns and priorities? If so, how? Um, we don't believe that a scaling function is a proper substitute for identifying all attributes impacting utility decision making. Um, it's not the most transparent or straightforward way to incorporate those attributes um, that the utility may care about. So if the goal is to incorporate ESJ concerns, we think it would be more accurate to adopt an additional attribute, for example, disadvantaged communities. Um, again, this is something that we've discussed in the past, um, and we have the um, test drive report from the test drive of the MAVF um, in, I believe that was A15050002, um, attached to our post pre hearing conference statements. Um, and in that test drive, the utilities, as well as um, TURN and the indicated shippers and EPUC, um, went through a test drive of the approach, and um, part of that included identifying all attributes for the MAVF, um, now the RDF. And in that, parties identified attributes beyond financial safety and reliability. Um, they identified um, compliance, customer satisfaction, environment, corporate image, workforce planning. I'm not necessarily saying that those are appropriate for adoption now, but um, it is um, a discussion of of why you may consider adding additional attributes. Um, and then the last slide, um, question four um, asked about whether the cost benefit approach had led to a change in thinking on the risk scaling functions. For us, no, um, the adoption of the CBA did not change our thinking at all. Um, and then question 10 asked, um, can a linear risk scaling function ensure that low probability, high consequence risk events are properly valued? Um, we believe um, a linear scaling function applies equally well to all events, including the low probability, high consequence events. Um, and our discussion of question two also um, addressed that. And that is it for our presentation. Um, we are here for any questions. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we probably could take one question if there's a clarifying question. And if there's not, if there's nothing in the chat. So uh, if there's not, if somebody doesn't raise their hand in the next 10 seconds, I'm going to go ahead, turn it over to PG&E to begin their presentation. Well, thank you oh, for the sorry. opportunity and the platform to present. Sorry, actually, Russell Archer just uh, raised his hand. So, Russell, did you want to ask a quick question? Hi, Russell, can you unmute yourself? Okay, took a, they took their hand down. So, okay, I'll go ahead and uh, shift it over to PG. Thanks again uh, to the folks from TURN. Much appreciated for your presentation. And Vincent, uh, you're up to bat. Thank you, Eddie. 
Um, so to start, uh, my name is Vincent Lowe from PGE, and with me today I have um, Yumi Um, also at PGE. She's director of uh, the Enterprise Risk Management Analytics team, and I also have Dr. Bilal Ayum. He is a professor of engineering at the University of Maryland, and uh, he's been working with us on this topic. And so, on behalf of the three of us, I would like to thank the PC. Uh, for giving us this opportunity to, to present our views on rescaling. Next slide, please. So one of the questions um, that was raised and uh, the, the planning questions was basically, well, what's changed now with the adoption of the cost benefit uh, um, um, approach? And for us, uh, kind of take a different approach. We kind of think that everything's changed. The cost benefit approach, because why? Why did everything change? Right? Because um, basically, the cost benefit uh, approach makes you put a price on risk. So, to, to state it simply, we have a loss of containment, gas transmission risk. No, when we do our rent filing, it's going to have a price. That's the dollars per year. Let's let's be really clear about that. Okay, so basically, so the question becomes: How are we going to put a price on that risk? And, and our response basically, we're going to put a market price on the risk. What's the advantage of doing that? Uh, we'll get to the advantage uh, uh, in, in the other slides, but basically, we're not the only ones pricing risk in dollars. Everybody knows that. Insurance company does that. Capital markets do that. So, and we're, we're talking dollars here, right? It's not like we're talking, it's not like we're talking, you know, dollar e-coin crypto or something like that we're talking dollars here so basically it's like you know we have dollars we should be able to compare those dollars to to to, to how others price these risks so basically to, now we have a, a, a yardstick and that was the intention of the commission all along to have a yardstick that we can use to see how we assess risk and make sure it's consistent so basically that's the approach that we're taking here the scaling function is one of the the features one of the the, the features of the, the rdf that we can use to calibrate our assessment of risk to what the market to what society thinks that uh, assessment of risk is so that's in a short summary of our kind of position um we can move on to the next slide vincent could you maybe move the microphone a little bit closer or speak? Oh my God. thank you can you hear me better now that's better thanks i just have to get closer to the screen yeah. Okay. So um, to 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 incorporate this view into the RDF, right? We're suggesting uh, the language that you see in in yellow. Um, so the 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 uh, RDF, you know, it's kind of you know it has all these um, kind of very rigid views. You know, things need to be uh, um, you know, risk neutral, risk uh, risk averse, but we want to kind of, you know, and and we make all these 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 uh, preferences. We talk about these preferences, but you know, I think that's a, a valid thing to be said for using what we call evidence based approaches. What the, what the, what does the available information out there that we have actually tell us about people's preferences? We don't really guess what the preference out there is. You know, I think mean, uh, risk neutral, whatever. It's like, but people already said in other settings, how can we use that information? So that's why we call it an evidence-based approach, right? So uh, evidence-based approaches can also be considered. This is the additional language I'm just reading, such as, but not limited to a market-based approach where, where applicable that number one, does not result in risk adjusted expected values lower than the expected monetized value of the attribute levels. And the, number two, notwithstanding the above, results in values consistent with prices and or estimates from risk transfer markets and or public policy towards risk transfer to the extent such pricing is applicable and available. So here we kind of make it explicit. One, one way, one, one form of evidence can look at markets. We can find markets that, are, that, that, that are, find information from the market. Which is to be consistent. Okay, so Eddie, let's go to the next slide. 
So um, up front, we just want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so on the advantage side, I want to mention that objective and transparent, right? So based on available data, data-driven, and or independent assessments, right? It's transparent in the sense that it's transparent. You can see the data. In fact, you know, some of the examples we pointed out in our white paper, um, you can see, I pointed to the sources. You can go online, click the links, you can see all the data that is transparent. Um, also, another advantage that we have is consistency and alignment, right? So the risk scores that we create, the risk scores that we'll be reporting, they're going to be consistent with how uh, others are looking, how other industries are, are, are assessing that risk. And I'll, I'll show later on in the example what I mean by consistency. So with consistency comes alignment, right? So now we have we 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 have policies that 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 are aligned, not just in this sector but throughout, right? You know, um, the, the commission oversees our, our our insurance policies. We want to make sure, I'm sorry, our insurance uh, activities. We want to make sure that that uh, the 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 decisions that we all make in in these different settings are consistent, and they don't have to be the same. They just have to be consistent, right? So that's the thing that that that's a great advantage. And then um, one of the other um, advantage there is basically it does it's not PG&E's uh, risk scaling function it represents societal values. You're looking at market prices objectively determined. It's not PG&E's. Represents what uh, uh, um, the markets and, and participants in there their assessment of risk. Um, if you look at the disadvantages, so. Yeah, this all the time with markets. It's like available availability of, of data. You know, do we have enough data to 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 uh, come up with a, a good good risk scaling functions, right? So, like I mentioned, we do have published sources. Those are available. I pointed out some of the references in the white paper, and we also have the, the ability to 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 employ utilize price discovery services, right? Price discovery services are brokers, market uh, assessment firms. Those are all out there, independent price discovery firms. Um, so we can check with those uh, that group of people. Right? That's that's typically how it's done, right? Um, I, I used to work on the energy procurement side of, of PG&E, and I, I dealt with our error filing, and we use market prices there as well. Uh, we would have forward prices for the next 20, 30 years. It's like uh, some of some of those we 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 couldn't we couldn't you, can, you know they don't get traded too often. But at the same time, you can uh, go to these price discovery firms to get uh, uh, an assessment of what those forward markets would look like. <clears throat> uh, second disadvantage is um, basically it's just methods might not be familiar as they are finance finance based. Um, just wanted to point out that uh, the the field that we're, we're kind of um, kind of drawing on is really option pricing field that that. Has been extensively studied. There's so much literature out there. It's just, um, it, it's very well studied, right? And 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 the, um, the 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 insights that that they've drawn from that that field um, really ap applicable to a lot of other situations. And and um, so it's not really a a. A, a disadvantage if you think about it that way, because here we're able to draw, we're able to draw from other industries how they manage risk in a real in a real world setting. It's not about textbooks, well, it's a real world settings, huge consequences. And a lot a lot of the 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 techniques that they use, a lot of the insights that they gain generally are applicable. So um one of the, the things that when we did our rank filing back in 2020, the first rent filing I was involved with back in 2020, um, Dr. Dr. Mitchell pointed out. Um, um, he pointed out his 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 um, power law distributions, and he he quoted one of those uh, books that he quoted. Um, the book is let me see if I can. It's a it's a real long title. Statistical consequences of fact tales. Real world pre asymptotics epistemology and applications papers and commentary and it's written by by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, right? Um you might be familiar with the name. He's the 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 author who, who uh, uh, wrote the popular text called The Black Swan. 
And so um, he started out in the finance field. Um, I actually I own one of his textbooks. It's called Exotic Options and Pricing or something. So 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 basically start out in the finance field. But if you read that text, right, it's it's beyond finance. It's basically um, uh, real world situations, not just about finance. Power law distributions, which is brought up in that text that Dr. Mitchell uh, uh, referred to, you know, he showed that basically those apply to a lot of uh, uh, real world phenomena. So anyway, um, using these quote unquote finance based methods, uh, I think it's actually a strength because you can once again can draw on on that that background. And and what, why do we want to limit ourselves to any particular area? The more insight we get from different uh, 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 industries, the better. And then finally, I um, want to mention as far as this advantages, yes, there could be situations where there's market mispricing, inefficiencies, distortions might lead us to underprice risk, right? And so kind of in response to that, we kind of had this policy safeguard there. And that's basically that safeguard that says you shouldn't be risky. You know, from the data I've seen on, on some of the market, I haven't seen such an occurrence where there's pricing, but sure, it could happen. So we need to be we need to be mindful that that things like that could happen, and we need to be prepared for that. This is this is risk management after all, right? So we need to be prepared for our contingencies. So that's why you can see if you go back up one slide, Eddie. That's why, and um, if you go back up, no one slide. That's why you can see. That's why we have uh, uh, item number one there does not result in risk-adjusted expected value low, lower than the expected monetized value of attributes level. It, it's it's a safeguard. Shouldn't happen, um, but it's a safeguard. Any questions so far? Okay. I will go, go on to the next slide. Um, so we talk about, we talk about, um, the risk preference, we talk about the utility function, so on and so forth. Um, maybe we can step back a little bit and just look at purely what um, the risk scaling function does, right? Basically, uh, the way the settlement uh, is written, it's a function you apply to the, the, the levels of the, mon of the monetized attribute. So basically, it's something, you, it, it's a function, uh, uh, it's a, it's a it's a function that you apply to, to your, your, your samples that you get, your trials that you get. So, so without going into to the economic aspect of it, basically just look at the math of it, right? The mathematics of it. Uh, a function of a random variable is a random variable. It's another random variable. It has its own distribution. It's gonna be, the distribution is gonna be transformed uh, from, in this case, the pure distribution to the to the the um, I think that's red. Uh, call it red distribution. But nevertheless, it's it's a distribution. It's its own distribution, and that that distribution is what we use. Or at least that expected value is 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 what we use uh, in our uh, risk calculation uh, lower time score. Right. So let's just let's you know do we do we let's just look at it from that ang uh, ang angle. Right. It's basically. A means of transforming from the original distribution to, to another distribution. So then the question is, well, what should it be transformed to? Good question, right? You don't want to transform it uh, uh, without a, a good basis of what to transform it to. Uh, basically, uh, our answer in this setting is basically it should be transformed to a distribution that's consistent with market prices. So that's how we look at it. You can talk about it in terms of risk preferences or whatever. We just, I think it's I think it's much more insightful to think about the distributions that you're dealing with. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about market data and talk about market distributions, what what exactly are we talking about? So this is some of the kind of information that's available out there, right? So. Um, one of the markets that we're looking at are both insurance markets and also this market called a catastrophe bond market. So what is a cat bond? A cat bond is a security that pays the issuer when a predefined disaster is realized, such as a hurricane causing 500 million in insured losses or an earthquake reaching a magnitude of 7.0 on the Richter scale. So basically, 
Um, don't want to get into too much details on 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 the structure because a lot of this is finance kind of. They 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 like to draw these kind of arrows in finance or, well. uh, but basically it, it shows that basically, um, for a fixed fee, so somebody who would issue a cap bond would be somebody like PG for a fixed fee, you know PG pays a fixed fee for a fixed fee, uh, somebody else a, a investor in this in this life is going to to assume that risk, right? So they and, and the kind of risk that they assume is 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 actually contractually written. So it's very specific what kind of risk that we, that they will they will uh, assume. So earlier we talked about the, the fine fine talk about certainty equivalent. She has certainty equivalent in action, right? We pay a certainty equivalent. Somebody else, investor is going to take on that risk. Certainty equivalent. So that's what basically a, a cat bond structure looks like. Um any any questions? Okay, I will move to the, the next slide. Here are some representative cap bond transactions that are out there. Um, I also provided in the paper, we also provided uh, a link to this, this Artemis bond, uh, cap bond deal directory. And it has a lot of information beyond uh, just the, the structures that I show here. But these ones are, are specific to wildfire risk. And you can see uh, we ourselves did a cat bond structure um, prior to the campfire, I believe, August 2018. We did a, a, um, a cat bond structure um, for the um, for wildfire. And I see Dr. Whitehead had a question um, in the chat and just wanted to mention that all our insurance activities, yeah, those, uh, those insurance forecasts, those uh, things are something that um, the commission has oversight on through our GOC process. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, you can see that some other cat bonds uh, structures that were done by SEMPRA. And it's kind of interesting, there were two done by LADWP, and this is the example that I will be using um, as an example of how we can infer, how we can pull up the, the probabilities um, uh, from those from these prices, so basically, um, really interesting, right? Uh, LADWP, public entity, um, and you can see here that they do the, the this uh, these structures. Let's look at the last one, October twenty twenty first. Interesting structure. Um, basically, it's saying here what we have here that when the deal is done, there's something called an attachment point coverage, and then. There's an expected loss. Expected loss. Uh, it says here it's on. You know, we look at the expected loss. It's 0.64 to 0.76 percent. And then the pricing. What actually transacted? What actually transacted? 15 percent. So the pricing for expected loss is roughly 20 to 23 times. Kind of interesting. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, Vincent, the uh, Katie Marsoni intern had uh, a clarifying question. Just uh, did did. Uh, ratepayers pay for the cap on the PG&E participated in? in I, I, I believe so. I believe that was an approved transaction. Um, yep. Okay. So, so one thing about these financial cap bonds, um, we know what that pay, what what that payoff looks like, right? So we know what that payoff looks like because it's all written in the contract. So uh, kind of describe the payoff that we that and uh, what that means, right? So earlier you saw next slide attachment uh, attachment point that basically means that's kind of like in the insurance land. It's kind of like you know everything below. It's kind of like a deductible, really. So you know you have the attachment points, kind of like a deductible amount. You know any any loss beyond before. Before that, you know, it's not going to be covered by this contract. And then there's a, a coverage level. And uh, between that attachment and that, uh, and once you're in the attachment level, once your losses in this particular case go above $125 million, uh, then the guy who, who's taking on the risk, they're going to, to compensate you, LADWP in this case, uh, or one to one dollar. Uh, loss until you reach the coverage level of thirty million dollars, right? So, uh, all the losses between one hundred twenty-five million to one hundred fifty-five million, going to be covered, 
uh, by, by whoever's uh, uh, buying this bond. So basically, um, anything after that, you know, you're above your coverage level, it's very similar to, to an insurance contract. So you look at the structure, you know, you can you can draw this this payoff diagram. And this payoff diagram looks like, you know, you can go online, I Google this, I went to Wikipedia, you know, and, and, and finance, you know, they call these things. Call spreads, I call them bull call spreads apparently. So, so basically these are the, the it's, it's basically a structure where, you know, you, you buy one option and you buy one call option and you sell one call option. I, I don't want to get into too much of the, those details, but basically the idea here is that these are the tools that we can use to analyze, to not, to, to basically infer out the, the information that we want uh, from, from this deal. So, so these are the financial kind of uh, uh, things that we, we can we can deal with. Uh, next slide. And Dr. Wojciech, I'm, I'm going to ask that we hold that question that you just asked uh, until after the presentation. We'll come back to it after the break. That's okay. So basically, once again, um, nothing new. Net present value uh, analysis here. Basically, it's saying that. Uh, the price of this contract, price of this contract is basically uh, the discounted expected payoff on the, uh, a distribution. So basically, um, to calculate the price, you would take the expected payoff, right? So the, the, the question is, which distribution do you use for your expected payoff? Well, you know, if you use the original distribution, you're going to get a number of between 0. 0.64 to 0.76%. And, and when I mean percent, it's percent of coverage, right? So earlier we saw that uh, the cat bond had a coverage of $30 million. So when it says 0. 0.64 to 0. 0.76, I believe that's roughly like, what, 175K, something like that. That's the expected price of that. There's this, this, uh, this expected price that you have to pay for this coverage, right? So that's what, what, what I mean by 0. 0.64 to 0.76%. So if you use the expected distribution, you get a, a price of 175K, I believe, something like that. But if you look at what the transacted price was, it was 15% or four and a half million dollars. So right, right. And so so what's different? What's different? Well, the payout structure is the same. That's that's written in the contract. That's the same. So what's different? Different is that basically when they're pricing these things, they're using a different probability measure. The, the 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 market participants, uh, uh, you know, since we have a transaction, right, kind of agreeing that probability distribution you use is not the original distribution, something else, right? That's how that's how you can get 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 uh, um, um, this information out because it's like basically saying that whatever probability distribution that the market's using is leading to a value that's twenty times higher. 15% versus 0.64, leading to value that's 20 times higher than what we would have expected. So what is that distribution, right? So, so that's, that's, that, that's key information that we can use to back out that distribution. Once we have that distribution, we have our original distribution, we know what that target distribution is. Yeah, then we can have a scaling function that, that kind of puts them together. Any questions? Okay, next slide. Um, so that's cat bonds. Another another uh, structure that we that we also um, uh, employ. So and basically, like I mentioned, this is this is an evidence based approach, right? So we want to be able to cast our white. I'm sorry, cast our net far and wide for for data. So uh, cat bonds is one source of data. There's also traditional insurance policy. That's another source of data. They have pricing information in there. And you can see the pricing is not too different from, I'm sorry, the payout structure is not too different from um, what we saw with the cat bond, for example. You saw this you saw this little hockey stick thing as well. You saw that in the previous example. Same thing, it's just that the, the, the levels are usually set uh, different, differently. Like with insurance programs, um, the the deductibles are usually much lower, right? So whereas cat bonds, really cat bonds, the name implies it, right? They're really for managing, managing, managing catastrophe risk. They're really for managing the tail events. 
and they're interesting because they give you information about what people are thinking about those tail events. But but nevertheless, it's the same kind of structure. It's just a different. It's just it's just focusing on different parts of the probability uh, measure. So here we have insurance policy. It's the same thing. Uh, we have we have um, uh, a coverage amount coverage. You know, we buy I buy car insurance. You buy car insurance. Amount coverage you have, and then there's a deductible, and then um, basically uh, the insurance. Uh, companies calculate these loss ratios, right? So the loss ratios are basically expected losses over premiums. And they generally range uh, 50 to 75% in general. You know, it can be more specific for specific industries, for specific companies. You have, you could have more general information about them. So anyway, that's another other kind of sample market data that we're using. Testing our wide net, trying to get the data in, in JTs. And see and see what kind of uh, distribution these data points imply. So uh, next slide. So okay. So with so uh, one thing that's interesting is that the more data points you have, basically I think the, the finance theory is basically if you get complete information, you would be able to come down to one distribution. You would have a unique distribution. You don't have complete information and markets. There's no complete markets like a kind of academic thing. You know, no markets are totally complete. But basically, if you have you have you have uh, uh, um, uh, incomplete information, then you still do, do need to make some assumptions, right? You need to make some assumptions about what kind of shape uh, your your distribution uh, function. Could, uh, I'm sorry, your risk scaling function could be. So in this particular case, in this particular example that we built out for LADWP, we kind of assume that um, the risk scaling function, and it doesn't have to, have to be this way. Right? This is one. This is just one alternative to doing things. That we the the risk scaling function really is what's called a piecewise linear function. Has three li linear segments. Uh, the first one, uh, and they kind of mirror on the sense of how companies look at insurance. That's a certain portion that of, of losses that what we call retention based companies just assume that there's a certain uh, 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 set uh, amount of losses that uh, companies will transfer to insurance com uh, insurance uh, uh, providers and then uh, the catastrophic losses that you might want to transfer that even the insurance companies uh, they, they they actually do the same thing they'll go out to reinsurance companies to transfer that catastrophic risk away right so so that's why you know Kind of roughly based on this three tier structure, um, we've kind of come up with this uh, three tier um, scaling function. Uh, first segment has a slope of 1.0 to kind of reflect the risk neutral thing. We want to retain those losses. And then, second segment and the third segment, they're going to have slopes, and we're going to calculate those slopes out of the market information. Uh, next slide. So I just want to uh, want to talk about again about um, this this example that we're going to show. And once again, it's just an example of how we're going to to how we could utilize the information that we have. Um, like I, I mentioned, you do need some assumptions. In this particular case, case you need to make some assumptions about un underlying loss distribution, and we do have some information about that. Uh, number of fires per year and the risk killing function. Those are basically some of the uh, assumptions you, 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 you need. And then we have some available data. I mentioned that we had the cap bond prices, we had the insurance loss ratios. Uh, we also have uh, the expected uh, cap bond prices, what the, you know, the expected value tells you versus what actually transacted. And then we also have um, I was able to look in this particular case when building out this example with LADWP. I was able to look on the website, and I think I found a report from the, the controller or something like that that mentioned that they had expected annual losses. They forecast their expected annual losses of roughly forty-two million dollars uh, per year. So, and you can see with these assumptions on the left, and with you know the available data we have on the right, we'll be able to to back out a distribution. And so, Eddie, if, if you want, you can switch to the spreadsheet now. 
<clears throat> oh, if you can, I can talk to the next one. Uh, actually, let me pull it up real quick. I had forgotten to open that file, but it should pop right in. There you go. Oh, can you make it a little larger? Sorry. Uh, uh, move it to another screen. Is that, will that work okay? Uh, yeah, I guess I can, I can see it. Okay. So, in, so let's start at the top, right? So, um, we know in, in our uh, risk function in our, in our, uh, RDF, what's risk? Risk is likelihood times consequence. And we interpret likelihood as frequencies, right? We, we know frequencies, number of occurrences per year times the consequence per occurrence. So the information that we got from, from DWR, so I keep saying DWR, I meant DWP. Um, the information that we got from DWP is on annual cumulative, we have $42 million. They, they estimated $42 million of uh, 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 damage every year. So basically, uh, we need to make some assumptions about, okay, how do we transfer that? How do we, how, how do we use an annual number, that annualized number? What, how do we get that into a per event consequence probability distribution, right? So basically, that's what we're trying to do here. That's why we need to make some assumptions about number of fires per year. It's 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 uh, it's an assumption, but actually, you know, um, you can you can you can get a you can make that probabilistic as well, right? I think in our last discussion when we were talking about um, climate change, we, I, um, I mentioned that you know how do you get rid of these uh, uh, assumptions? Well, you take the ensemble average, you calculate the average, you assign probabilities to four fires a year, five fires a year, six five fires a year, take that, you assign probabilities to, 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 to that, and then you calculate the average across these different things, these different number of fires for you. So you can, you can, you can, yeah, you can, uh, you can basically get rid of that assumption too, that, that strong assumption of four fires per year. I didn't want to do it because it's just kind of block the spreadsheet. Um, Excel, you know, once again, I think we mentioned this in our, in our in our workshop one comments. Excel's not very good for, for running these Monte Carlo trials because they take up a lot of data. And um, this this example you see here is basically a uh, Monte Carlo example. It, it doesn't look Monte Carlo yet because uh, I said it's a static mode, but if you actually make it actually draw live random samples, you get different answers every time you press the F9 button. But basically, so, so we know, okay, so let's make the assumption that there are four of these large fires every year. Um, and we assume also further that the fires are not normally distribution, distributed. We can change that assumption later on. We can say that the power are distributed. But, you know, one thing about uh, uh, a log normal has two parameters. One's the mean, one's the standard deviation, right? Mean's pretty easy. Take 42 million, divide by four, uh, that's the, the, the mean 10 and a half million per, per event. Standard deviation, oh, okay, standard deviation per, per event. Hmm. Well, what can I do? So basically, I can calibrate, I can calibrate. I can plug in a number for the standard deviation that gets me back to a $42 million number. Because, for example, Eddie, if you change that standard deviation number there, change it to whatever, 15 or whatever. One sec. Uh, is this a trusted document? I hope so. Okay, 15. Yeah, 15, 16, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, okay. so now if you go to the bottom, if you go scroll a little bit bottom, oh, you might have to hit F9. Ah. Yeah, hit F9. Are you on F9 mode? Can you scroll up? Sh should have already uh, run the, the process. Did you want the graph or did you want the... Uh... The chart below it. Um, I want to to look at the graph above. Um, uh, the the. I'm sorry. I want to look at the number below. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Hmm, doesn't seem to be working. But basically, uh, if you go back up, it seems to be frozen. Um. It, maybe you want to change it to 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 from static mode to live mode, whatever. No, uh, just above that, if you hit Monte Carlo, it says static. Ah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. 
So now if you scroll down. That looks like it changed. Yeah, so it changes. So by changing the standard deviation, maybe we need to change the standard deviation larger. You can see that in column and sorry, sorry, cell B44, that's the simulated value of the 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 distribution, right? We know it needs to match $42 million. So that's why that's why we can use the standard deviation to calibrate so that the simulated value matches $42 million. So there's another example of calibration. So basically if you go back up, um, Basically, if you go back up, you can see that that these these are the parameters we can change to to get the pricing, the, to get the, the distributions to match up to the prices that we've seen, right? So now, if you put it back to uh, static value, and you put that back to twelve point one, I guess you need to put it back to twelve point one. Yeah, twelve point one. So you can see basically here. Uh, we've calculated um, um, what the payoff structure for would be for the the um, 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 the, the the cat bond and the insurance uh, loss ratios, right? So you can see, for example, uh, if I use this set of parameters, and you know, you would the way I did it was basically trial and error. You know, there are more sophisticated sophisticated ways to do that, but if you use these parameters, you would get a expected value that you see for the cat bond, that's in cell D44, you would get an expected value of 0.64, right in line with what we saw in the publications, right? What we saw in the data. You would get a, a, a uh, implied value of 14%, kind of close to the 15% number. You would get a multiplier of 22%, uh, 22, right? in the estimate of basically 20 to 23 times that we saw in the data that you did. You would get a a um, loss ratio that is in cell I forty four. You will get a loss ratio of basically close to fifty percent, right in in line with the ranges that we were expecting. So so that's what we mean by by calibrating, right? But I think what's more important, what's more interesting, what's more insightful, if if you look at is if you look at that 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 distribution, if you go up and just scroll the chart. So now you earlier you saw in the slides that I was talking about this different distribution, one was in blue and one was in red. So now you see that with real data here that the market implied distribution is what's given by the uh, red one. Do you have a, a buzzing sound? Is that the That's our FEMA alert? Uh, isn't everybody glad that I mentioned that already? No panic. All okay. good. Still almost had a heart attack. Yeah, it, it shocked me too. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Vincent. Yeah, so so it's interesting, right? It's just interesting because now we actually know what the distribution that the market is expecting. Uh, the market's pricing towards this is what this is what the societal uh, society that this is the distribution they 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 uh, are using in their risk assessment, and you can actually use this to to answer really interesting questions, right? Because if you scroll down, it's really interesting. Uh, you can really interesting, right? So for example, you can see I, I calculated an, another probability here just with the distribution I had, just with the data I had. Probability that the, the loss will go over 125 million dollars. So if you look at the, the expected in blue cell I44, it's one percent, but the market and price distribution is 19 percent, right? And if you look at now, now you can now you can ask yourself the question too. I think the most important one is really interesting is uh, you look at cell B44 and cell B uh, C44, right? So. Uh, remember, we said the expected value was for forty-two million dollars. So yeah, that forty-one point four nine, pretty close to forty-two million dollars. But look at what that market implied distribution, what its mean is. It's ninety-one and a half million dollars, right? So the market's pricing as if um, there's a ninety-one million dollar uh, uh, mean. And and in, in finance, they 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 talk about. And we mentioned this in our paper as well. Finance to talk about the risk neutral distribution. It's not that invest. It's not that 
investors are whatever are, are risk neutral. They don't have a risk neutral preference. But that's a distribution. If you adjust the distribution suitably based on market prices, you come to a point where there's a distribution where investors can be thought of as as uh, uh, behaving risk neutral. So that's the risk neutral distribution. It's in in, in our this graph. Very, very uh, familiar concept. You can just Google risk neutral distribution. And you probably come up with a million references on that. Um, you know, this theory has been around since the 70s. So it's a, it's a very uh, um, uh, uh, familiar concept uh, from finance. There's a distribution that you can use uh, to, to, that you can, there's a distribution that makes you behave as you were risk neutral. And earlier we had comments about, well, you know, the, 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 um, um, scaling, scaling function, the risk preference is not, trans, not transparent, too difficult to use. Well, we just transform the probabilities according to the market prices and you're risk neutral. Away we go. Everything's the same. Just use the orange distribution. Vincent, so earlier, yep. I, I'm going to kind of try to move you along because we're already uh, cut into some of the break okay. time and the yep. discussion time. So okay. can I go back so, to the uh, slides? Next slide. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the last slide. I think I'm basically just there. Um, uh, one more slide. Next slide. Oh, um, so, so here we want to say basically that, um, we have the scaling functions. How can we incorporate, um, other externalities, you know, uh, in, in, in the scaling function ESJ concerns. Uh, once one way we could do that, we have the framework for what the economic uh, uh, factors are right. The market prices. We can add in non-market pricing uh, information too, right, to represent our ESJ prioritization. We can add in factors on top of what's backed up by the market. We can add in multipliers to the scaling function, and those multipliers can be determined from data, right? So, for example, if we look at uh, the income levels at BBC communities, maybe we can base the multipliers, scaling multipliers, uh, based on that. And you know, we've been talking about wildfire risk a lot. Well, uh, we also, you know, this approach is general to all risk. You know, it's not just wildfire risk. It, it's basically what data do we have? So ideally, we want to be able to to use this. We think that you know we can do this risk. But we should be able to do this ideally risk by risk, attribute by attribute. Um, and there's certainly data out there for different kinds of risk. There's cyber, uh, that that cat one data, cyber crime, of great floods. It, it's it's there. basically. However, I think that you know it's going to be a time. We need to get ourselves familiar. We need to get our, our, our expertise up. We need to get the data developed. We need to identify the data sources. So you know we can start in stages. We can start with kind of more general data as we identify more data, more relevant data. We can bring those in. And then I think the the last one, um, last slide. I'll just jump to the last slide. Okay, this slide. Just wanted to mention that. Um, Treating the scaling function as basically a transformation of uh, uh, probability, probability distributions. I uh, think we think it's a very kind of fruitful way of thinking of it. Right? Leads to new avenues of inquiry. And, and I actually came up with this example um, after we wrote the white paper. So that's why we didn't put in the white paper. But maybe that's, and, and, and we, I put not one, but two, two construction cones here. Just to re represent that, you know, this is something. This is something you know you can consider. Think about, you know, thinking about it. So that's an idea. So there's two construction cones there. But basically, you know, what is if we want to transfer, like Dr. Mitchell said, what if we want to transfer all of our, uh, what what if we want to look at all of our risks? Assume that the risks that we don't know, what we want to see, assume them to be power distributions. We can do that with the scaling function. We can assume that. That the transform distribution is a power distribution. We can use the market data to back out parameters for the power of distribution. One of the issues Dr. Mitchell identified in the power of distribution was how do you trans how do you truncate the power of distribution? Because it has an infinite mean. The, the value for the, the, the risk would be infinity. How do you how do you how do you truncate the power of distribution? Well, why not look at the market price? We can use that to calibrate what the truncation levels should be. We can use that to cal calibrate what the growth uh, uh, alpha parameter should be. So that's that's a thought, and you can do you can do it in a general way. And so whatever distribution you start with, apply this scaling function, and you you end up with a power power distribution. 
So anyway, I just wanted to to conclude uh, my my uh, presentation there, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right, thanks a lot, Vincent. We actually do have quite a few questions, and actually some of them uh, are also uh, for turn. Uh, there were some questions that came into the chat after you had already started presenting. What I'd like to do is actually take us into a break. Um, I know that you had this extra slide at the end here, uh, Vincent. But did, is it okay if we if we skip that, or did you? Have I, I, I think I well, okay. Yeah, maybe I should go through this. So uh, last thing I just wanted to mention. Sorry, I was rushing. I even forgot my own slide. Okay. But sorry, I was rushing. I just wanted to mention. So thanks for telling me. Um, end of the day, I don't think that uh, we don't think that the PUC should mandate any rescaling function um, because we already we we already have the tools right now to to look at uh, the rescaling in a very objective manner, right? Cost benefit uh, ratio uh, approach. We can co compare risk directly with what other industries how they assess the risk. We provide an example of how it could be done. It's just an example uh, meant to prompt discussion. It shows you how we can back up the distribution. And the important thing to, to, to understand is that uh, market prices provide a way to be consistent in making investment decisions, right? So if you're looking at just uh, 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 linear slope expected value risk killing function, um, and I'll get to this point a little bit more later on because I believe that's one of the questions we'll be discussing. Um, the physical mitigation programs likely going to have a lower value than uh, than the financial product because the distribution that we backed out is is, is more skewed to the right, right? This is going to have a higher expected value. So why should it have a higher expected value? Why should a financial product, admittedly inferior, why should it have a higher value than a physical mitigation? Something wrong, right? So it's like. We need, to, we need to be consistent. We can't say, oh, I'm, I'm going to value this physical mitigation at $4 million, but I'm going to value the financial equivalent at $9 million. It's just wrong. So anyway, uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, we just want to mention that um, in conclusion, just want to close it off by saying, how are you should maintain the ability via the risk scaling function to apply the latest information and innovation, innovations across industries to the RDF? Okay. And now that finally completes my presentation. Thanks, Vincent. Okay, my uh, suggestion is that uh, we try to take a quick break uh, and try to get back here by uh, 11.33, and then we'll start our Q&A session. Um, and um, yeah, I, I have written down uh, a number of people who have asked questions, and we'll come back to those as soon as we get back. So we'll be right back at 11.33.
All right, I'm going to bring us back in. Uh, I would like us to start the discussion session at this point. Um, and we're going to start off uh, with a couple of questions that came in um, for turn. Um, the first was from it's Russell Archer from uh, SCE. I believe he's the uh, director of the general rate case for Southern California Edison. He had some audio issues. Um, uh, I can read them out, or uh, Katie or Dr. Feinstein, if you'd just like to jump into them, feel I'll, free. I'll just jump into them. Thanks. Um, and ask about the first. There was a discussion, a question about the state legislature and and what that reflects. And I would say that I'm not going to get into a discussion of <laughs> my political science uh, classes here. But I, I don't. Um, we're we're here to discuss. The RDF and the position that we believe that risk scoring within the commission should take. And as a perspective of providing information to the commission on the value of different mitigations, we believe that a linear risk scaling approach is most appropriate as a minimum requirement. Um, and to the other questions, I think I would highlight that TURN um, has previously proposed and presented and argued that we should be um, looking at the cost effectiveness of all work that is being required to be done, including controls and existing regulations and mitigations um, to determine whether we're actually requiring the most cost effective um, work to be done. Um, not all of the regulations are necessarily informed by cost effectiveness consideration or scored via the RDF. And so, um, to the extent that we were to um, score those in the future, we would recommend using a um, linear risk scale in the calculation um, of that. And then um, re uh, in response to Mr. Ayub, um, I didn't see questions there. Um, I saw you know, comments, which um, we will take those and consider them as we potentially update our proposal and potentially we'll respond to them and our comments to the proceeding. Fair enough. Uh, I, 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 if there's a question there, I'd be happy to answer it. I just didn't see one. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Ayub, if you would like to rephrase anything and present it as a question, uh, you're welcome to. Um, or Dr. Feinstein, did you have anything else that you would like to add? No, I'm with, uh, excuse me a moment. Sure, no problem. Uh, the joys of working at home. Um, I, no, I had no question. I, I didn't hear a question, so I don't know what to say. Uh, it sounded like there was an interesting statement made uh, that said that, uh, if I remember correctly, that something called the center of gravity, which I don't understand, uh, results in saying that uh, for the most part, people are slightly risk averse. Okay, well, if people are slightly risk averse, then risk neutrality is a pretty good approximation. Okay, um, scroll down just to see. Okay, um, great. Uh, I guess we can then uh, shift it. I, actually, I do have one question for, for Dr. Ayub, though. Actually, it, you, you mentioned this, uh, the Price-Anderson Act to Limit Nuclear Liability. Um, if you have, uh, you, know, an, you know, maybe a link or something that you could, could provide us to, to that uh, discussion, I think that would actually be very helpful. We, we would appreciate um, some additional information. And, of course, you're welcome to, to pg e is welcome to include that in there. Uh, comments and reply sections, but if you're able to provide it uh, now, that that also would be welcome. So, um, with that said, uh, Eddie, uh, this is Chuck Feinstein. Can I make a small comment, please, about this? Uh, I think this is very important sure. because the price, it, what the Price-Anderson Act, in effect, did was remove the risk uh, associated with uh, with operating a nuclear reactor to a great extent, and there is, it's possible to make an argument that that act distorted um, the operational risk associated with the nuclear industry. And it's also possible to make an argument that that caused us to be in the situation we're in right now with respect to nuclear power. 
Okay. So the, the act has consequences. And the interesting thing for us is about how risk is priced. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think at this point, then, uh, uh, I will shift uh, towards some of the questions that are directed towards uh, pg and &E. And the order that I, I had them in uh, begins with uh, Dr. Wojcik from uh, UCAN. And I'll try to scroll up to some of those questions. But um, I guess the, the main overarching question that you had, Dr. Wojcik, was just should ratepayers pay for cap bonds? Uh, and I think you clarified or gas sales. And I was wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit more about that. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. Well, well, Vincent, I really appreciated the presentation. And, and in, in general, I think I, I like the methodology of using market. I really wanted to talk a little bit about market and ask the question. Um, with regard to using the market, I, I'm worried that this is like looking for lost keys under the lamppost, hoping the illumination, illumination would help. Um, we have a lot of incomplete markets. We have a, a real lack of data on a whole set of things, and particularly around uh, some of the key variables that are going to be in our process for risk um, allocation. Uh, fires are easy. Droughts, okay, different. Uh, ocean level, different. What about gas sales? Gas sales um, are something that is a huge impact that we still haven't gotten to. It's an impact. But how are you going to price or find a, a, a reference market um, of any kind that's going to tell you that the cost of gas sales in terms of climate change is X. And so I'm worried that uh, this is going to work for some things, your approach for pg and &E, and I, I do appreciate it, but I can't see how it's going to work when you want to price natural gas sales. Um, and where is the database for market-related risks uh, for these things? So, thank you. And, and Vincent, could I add uh, one additional uh, point to that regarding cybersecurity? How would cybersecurity be priced in, in this context as well? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So, um, I'm going to drop a link. So, the second question is the easiest one. Uh, did I just drop a link to Eddie or to other? I'll try to drop a link to everyone. Yeah, you can go ahead and drop the link into the chat if you want. I, I just did um, to everyone. Ah, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Just a reference to uh, a source. Um, I, I looked in this. I looked in the the the, the bond deal uh, cap bond deal directory. Um, that is cyber risk cap bonds, that earthquake cap bonds. There's a cap bond done by FEMA. There's flood cap bonds in there. So some of the uh, so some of the things I think you you're asking about uh, cap, uh, cyber risk cap bonds in there as well. So. And take a look at some some of that. And um, the other question related to the gas sales, I'm I'm not so clear on the question. Uh, uh, is the question that that uh, gas sales is somehow is, is tied to climate change? Um, uh, um, maybe you can. Um, I, I don't see the link right now. That of me, but um, maybe Dr. Uh, Wojcik can explain that. Yeah, Vincent. Excuse me, this Eric. Um, uh, Protect Our Communities Foundation and UCAN has raised this on a number of occasions, and uh, we're still hoping that it's going to be part of the agenda for discussion. But gas throughput, as some of the, one of the largest impacts on climate change for any of the IOUs in California, it's got to be huge. So, how how would we consider that? Thanks. I think I'm going to have to get back to you. Uh, I'm going to have to check with our gas uh, theme on our gas. Because um, I, 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 yeah, I'm just going to have to get back to you on that. I uh, think about that. Is that okay? And I'll just remind uh, that when we had our discussion about climate change uh, last week, that um, we were focused primarily on, uh, you know, the, the quantitative uh calculations of, of how climate change could be integrated within the rdf but um that was in the context of uh the you know risks that are uh, associated with uh, safety reliability and financial uh in this proceeding so um just wanted to to 
uh, refer uh, remind uh, everybody about that. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, Roseanne uh, Rekovic. I always mispronounce your name. I'm really sorry. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, Roseanne uh, uh, from Energy Division asked a, a couple of good questions that I think uh, we'd appreciate hearing PG uh, respond to regarding are there structural investments the IUs can do that reduce the risk of loss that are equal to or greater than the return on purchasing cat insurance? And do these investments then impact the shape? Of the risk curve in terms of the value of premium to insurance payout. So yeah, I think uh, the answer to the first question: Are there structural investments that I was going to answer? I'm close, right? Yes, and uh, that's what the, the physical mitigations that we're talking about in this proceeding. Um, and and like I mentioned, they 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 more often greater than the return on purchasing cap insurance because you're not just Compensating somebody and preventing a risk to start in the first place, and our our, our concern, you know, is that if, if if we don't help the market prices, is that you'll be pricing these two things differently. And why should that be the case? And 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 you're exactly right. So the next question you have here: Do these investments that impact the shape of the risk curve in terms of value of premium to insurance payout? Uh, I, I, I can't speak for the insurance companies, but I have noticed that there are some um, um, in other proceedings they have mentioned that yeah, if you if you if you lower the, the risk in your system to start with, then yeah, or else being equal, uh, that should need to lower the risk premiums. I've heard them mention it. I was reading Commissioner Lara's report on insurance in for residential markets and. And um, they've been stressing the need for physical mitigations, the, the, the improvements you can make in your house and stuff like that. Those help. And I think the insurance companies are mentioning, oh, you can make your house more fire resistant. Yeah, that will, that will definitely help us manage the risk. We need to lower more manageable risk premiums. But that's that said. Okay, great. Um, and Roseanne, did that help answer your question or did you have any follow ups? Yeah, that that does answer that question. I guess my question came out of um, your presentation appeared to focus a lot on buying the risk down by being able to have the insurance companies being able to choose a, a payout that would cover the risk. And so my my question was really about not implying any particular mitigation, but from the perspective of you know, buying insurance bonds don't risk don't reduce the risk of the event from happening. So, but what your answer tells me that what you're saying is that you're using the insurance market. If I'm understanding it right, you're using you're using the insurance market and the premium pricing and the risk payout um, to provide a comparative number. For mitigations that would potentially reduce that risk comparatively, I I guess, uh, and, and that's that's that last part that I'm not sure I'm. No, seeing you, you got following. it. You, you, you got it. You got it. You got it. Okay, great. And uh, actually, I think that's a good segue to to some of Dr. Feinstein's questions. Um, so they're. Pretty straightforward. Uh, are you trying to find the correct? And he has that in quotations for the market price of a mitigation. Uh, and then, are you suggesting that PGE buy bonds rather than perform mitigations? Uh, are you suggesting that ratepayers pay for, say, undergrounding wires and PGE's bond purchases? So let's start with the second question. Are you suggesting? No, uh, are you trying? No, it's the second question. Are you, are suggest you suggesting that PG? PG need buy bonds rather than perform uh, mitigations. No, not at all. Uh, basically, what we're saying is that we need to have a a a a, uh, a consistent measure of benefits, right, across all these different forms of risk uh, transfer risk mitigation. You can't have a different yardstick for measuring benefits when you're looking at financial instruments, and then use a different uh, yardstick for measuring. Uh, uh, for measuring physical uh, the benefits benefits from physical um, uh, mitigations. 
So uh, we we think that just leads that's just going to foul things up. <clears throat> Are you suggesting that rate payers pay for say in the grounding wires and PG bond purchases? Once again, what we're suggesting here is we just need to be consistent. We just need to be consistent. Use the same measures uh, when we do our assessment of of any of our programs. Be they underground, be bond purchase, whatever program, just need to be consistent. Are you trying to find the correct or the market price of a mitigation? Uh, I'm not sure what's meant by correct, but I do want to mention this. Um, if you can pull out that example again, uh, um, yeah, you can go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, this slide, yeah. I want to mention something that's interesting, Dr. So Feinstein mentioned earlier about how we have uh, a bias um, in, in, you know, we use the risk scaling function, risk reverse scaling function, we have a bias. So I just, um, and I see Dr. Mitchell on the line too, so I'm sure you have plenty to say about this. But I can tell you one thing, that, that number, that $42 million expected value, that's a bias number. It's bias lower. It's bias low. Why is it bias lower? Because you know, if we have we have, if we have these fat tail events, if we have power distribution, if we have fat tail events, all the observable data that you can see are bias low. You never see the catastrophic events until after they happen. Right? You never see that. So all the, so whatever number you're using, that forty two million dollar number, it's just based on what you've seen. And I was like, have you actually seen a one in a million event? Did you, you see it ahead of time? Probably didn't. So that number is bias low. And so, so uh, you know, we, we just need to recognize that in the, in the face of uh, a lot of the, the, the real world scenarios that were out there. So the real question to ask ourselves is, well, I guess people can ask the question, well, you know, what evidence do you have for power law distribution or fat tail distribution or tail events. I think the question should be asked the other way around. What evidence do we have that distributions are narrow tail for the normal distribution, low normal distribution? What's the evidence for that? Because there's plenty of evidence for uh, fat tail distributions in fires in Maui, flooding in Vermont, winter Texas. We've got plenty of those events. And it's interesting when you look at the, the cat bond data, you look at the cat bond data, it's very interesting. Because you look at the data and uh, I, I pointed to that source, you can look at the pricing for all those, for all those um, um, deals that are there. And those are deals really that, that measure the, 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 the tail risk, right? It's about the tail risk. Those are deals that measure the tail risk. And I've looked through it, I, I find virtually no deals that are priced close to expected values. The price at some multiple expected values. What's that telling me? How many people, including people like LADWP and, 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 and you know, the bias of the bond, are telling me that they think that, that you know, you, that the, the underlying distributions, that the, the ones that we can observe from data is, is basically uh, going to be under bias and uh, the true risk. That's why, the, that's why the premiums are so high on, 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 on the, uh, the cap bonds. And basically, you can do even better with that information. You can back out, like we've shown in this example, you can back out what the distributions, what the tail should look like, right? This is what people are assessing the tail to be. You saw that example, right? The probability of $125 million loss. Probability of that, if you use the, the expected value here, you can see right at the bottom there on the right, 1.1%. So, but basically people saying you're underpricing that, underpricing that tail event. And we think it's closer to 20%. So, uh, you know, a lot of this, like I mentioned, you know, um, this book, once again, one of a uh, huge uh, shout out to Dr. Mitchell for pointing out that, that book to us. Um, so basically, Talib's book, um, what does he have to say about that, right? So let's see what Talib has to say. I will paste that. Uh, page 15 of his book, and I'll give you a link to his book. So what does Talat have to say about that? 
and he's talking about black swan. Basically, there are things that fall outside what you can expect and model and carry large consequences. The idea is not to predict them, but be convex, or at least not concave to their impact. Fragility to a certain class of events is detectable. You, you, can, you know how you know how vulnerable you are to certain events. And it's, it's not about predicting them. It's basically about you need to make sure that you 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 might not be able to predict the exact probabilities of stuff happening or whatever, but you need to recognize that you are susceptible to those events. And the way to be to, to do that is to be convinced. So so once again, so the idea is to not predict them, but be convex, at least not convex to that, not concave to that impact. Fragility to certain class of events is detectable, even measurable, by gauging second order effects and seeing a symmetry of responses, of responses for the statistical attributes of these events may remain elusive. May never be able to predict the tail, but you would know what happened when the tail, tail happens, right? That you know. So so that that is that that is what that's what Taleb says about with new chat, new chat, new trilogy, and I will um, post the reference here. I'm going to actually let Dr. Mitchell jump in here since he has a question and you've mentioned him a couple of times. Um, yeah. Dr. Mitchell, did you want to uh, speak directly to some of the yeah. questions that you've asked? Sure. Uh, yeah. Hi, Vincent. And I mean, that's, this is a really interesting presentation. Uh, yeah, I, I, the question I posted in the chat uh, was just basically stating that, okay, where do the underwriters who are pricing, who, who are, you know, creating these bonds get their data? Uh, isn't there a physical distribution of actual risk, which is represented by an existing body of research, publications, limited data, and varying models? And don't the underwriters draw from this same body of information that everybody else does. So if it's my understanding, don't the capital markets just place bets on where the underwriters interpretations are of these this underlying data. So the question is what what information do the capital markets add? So basically, you know, I I kind of um, um I won't say I've experienced experience, but you know, kind of um had some um, um, knowledge about how we did our cat bond. So basically, when you do a cat bond, you basically have to put out like a perspective, right? You, you get an independent agency to come in here, to come in and basically do an independent assessment. You give them the data that they require. You do an ind independent assessment of the risk. So this is, they, they find out the you know, number of service territory, miles, whatever they need to know. And they'll do an assessment of that, that risk. And then that's the assessment that goes out with, with the, I guess, at the bond perspectives. So that information is available out there. So, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, they do have the information. Um, so, so, so basically, with that information, that the investors would take a look at that information and then make their own uh, judgment. They might do more research around it. They might make, uh, you know, might look at the specifics of that that situation, see whether this is the one risk. Uh, but if it's their risk profile, this is some risk that they want to take on and off. So, uh, right. yeah, yeah, I, I just find it difficult to to think that with this body of information that the person who's actually an investor in this is going to have a deeper understanding of the the actual fundamental risk, what it actually is. But I think what you said there at the end kind of says something because people are risk averse they will tend to inject convexity into the their purchases uh the the post that yumi shared uh regarding the uh cyber security uh bonds and how you know what the risk return pricing on that is people tend to possibly over quote unquote overestimate risk based on the information they have but if you're actually dealing with true uh tail risk then that would actually be biased in the same direction as the actual risk you follow me i, I think so i think so 
Does that make uh, sense? I, I think that that is a that is a uh, go back to one of the the, the bond deal that we did, right? So um, you know, and it's a real market. It's a real market. The, the guys are taking on this risk. Right? So maybe if you can go back to to the to that. We go back uh, to the deal that we did. Uh, yeah, this drill database. So on this date of issuance, August 2018, $200 million coverage. Uh, they got $7.5 million, $15 million for the risk that we took on. And I'm pretty sure they had to pay out $200 million on this on this deal. So it's a, it's a, it's a, real, it's a real market, whether they, 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 they underpriced it. I don't, if you look, if you talk to the, those issues, they probably thought that they did not underprice it. Uh, right. So, so then the question is, uh, okay, so sometimes the risks are mispriced. So, you know, 2007, 2008, there were mispriced bonds in the market. That was one, one thing that was underlying the, the housing, uh, you know, mortgage bonds were mispriced. Uh, if you had priced wildfire catastrophe bonds prior to and after the campfire wouldn't that have caused a you know would you expect your cat bonds to be equally priced before and after those is there any data on that <laughs> probably not probably not in fact uh, you can read our insurance testimony and and you know GRC we have a chapter I think it's exhibit two I think so you can take a look at it and and, and basically it just shows that the premiums we're paying on the insurance side uh, are probably much larger. Uh, are in fact much larger. Yeah. So the so because we're dealing with un basically an o an open tail, you know, if most insurances take into account lots and lots of losses, they have a good statist makes good statistical base to choose from. But when you don't have a good statistical base and you have this open you know, open tail on one side where you don't really understand what the maximum loss is, then, uh, you know, what your quote on Talib regarding convexity sort of comes comes into play there. And I, I and I think what you're telling me is that investors tend to do this on their own when looking at the data. Uh, that's how that's how the prices trend. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm saying basically that that the investors are behaving as if the tail is much fatter than it and needs than 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 just implied from the data, okay. and that's because the data under biases uh, the mean, and, and you know this as well. With the power distribution, pure power, there is no mean. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like so. It's like whatever, whatever we we take. And the biases. So and, okay. and, and they might not they might not say it in the same technical terms, but you know, intuitively. And and I love that that quote from Taleb's book. He was like, if you talk with your grandmother and you talk to the professors about risk, it's usually the grandmothers who are right. <laughs> and that was right. quote. I thought that was great. And basically it's like their intuition is telling you something. You know, us as a society is telling you something. Probably the modeling's wrong. And maybe maybe we can just let Yumi jump in here. She's had her hand up for a bit. Yeah, I would add um, the the reason that cat bonds prices or investors investors put a huge premium on these cat bonds are because of the uncertainty inherent in this risk, right? So it's not about the maximum losses unknown because there is a limited coverage, but the, they perceive the probability of that event happening, that event meaning the loss happening uh, has huge uncertainty around it. And so even if this third party firm, modeling firm have all the information to be able to model the probability of event happening, there is this inherent uncertainty that's a lot higher than at the frequent event that we see, like insurance, um, what insurance would cover, right? So regardless of whether we are able to better model them, 
we still have the uncertainty around the probability of that event happening. Uh, and that's what the prices reflect. So I just wanted to mention it, it is more about fundamental uncertainty in, in the ability to model the probability of those catastrophic events uh, because it's not observable. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks, Yumi. Um, I, I, there was one other question from uh, ALJ Fogel. Uh, to a certain extent, though, I, I feel like maybe it was already answered, um, unless Judge Fogel, you, you wanted to, to add something. Um, if you do, you can be uh, oh, right there. If not, uh, you can feel free to, to add into the chat. Um, let's, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Thanks, Judge Fogel. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple things going on here. Um, I was just, uh, you know, wondering, it it's, uh, seems as though, as there's been discussed uh, at the last end here, that the perception of, of risk and likelihood and uncertainty bounds may differ amongst investors, particularly after a major event. And I was just, you know, wondering, it seems conceivable that the commission might choose for whatever reason to not approve a certain cat bond rate and resulting um, you know uh, funding level for ratepayers uh, and I was wondering if what Vincent's thoughts were in the it seems as though there should be alignment if there's a if the commission is going to approve a cat bond mate rate with that should be be reflected in the in the market rate that would be considered um, a lot as part of your proposal. Would you agree with that? Or yeah, I think if you if you if you um, scroll back, uh, Eddie, if we scroll back to the language that we were proposing. So yeah, you can see uh, um, notwithstanding the above item number two, notwithstanding the above results in values consistent with prices and all estimates from risk transfer markets and or public policy towards risk transfer. And I, I believe that, Your Honor, is, is what you were uh, um, referring to. Thank you. But I think that assumes that there's a fairly sophisticated interrogation of what's going on in a GRC rulemaking for the commission to sort of unearth these and align these values potentially, that seems potentially challenging or would certainly require a lot of transparent, you know, disclosure around the filing. Yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting thing, but I think one thing that's helpful is that um, we all understand dollars. So um, when you talk about dollars, you know, it, it, is, it is drawing that, that conclusion that that line is indeed challenging. We saw how we tried to put together the, the impact of the redistribution, but um, the, the, the preferences that we express in our, uh, 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 whether we want to approve or, or not approve a purchase or approve or not approve a, a, a policy, that's, that, that's information too. And so how do we be consistent with that information? Uh, we should go ahead and make those policies and, 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 and use whatever methods we have, statistical methods, the financial methods, and back up to make sure that that the scaling function actually supports those policies as opposed to be dictated by the math to tell you what your policy should be. I, I hope that makes sense. Oh, uh, go ahead, Judge Fogel, if you had something you wanted to. Uh, no, that's it, thank you. I, I just wanted to, to add to that though, that, that Vincent, I think what Judge Fogel is also highlighting is that um, in the, the case that uh, this, would, this type of a risk function would be presented to a GRC, it would probably require the utilities to present uh, quite a bit of transparent detail about how the, the risk scale was actually presented. And it may require unpacking uh, a lot of the models uh, that go beyond uh, what PG&E has you know, control over. 
Yeah, we fully expect that when we do that, um, you know, we will have to show the data that we're relying on, right? Since we we're saying it's evidence based, so we need to show how we, what the evidence we're using, and and how we, um, what and the inferences we draw from that. That, that evidence. Well, and particularly, you know, uh, getting to, to what Judge or sorry, what Dr. Mitchell was was mentioning that you know the the insurers are you know making they're underwriting and taking bets based on the physical uh, data, um, and how are you going to be able to transparently demonstrate that the way that they did it was an efficient way to to you know manage the market. We don't, we don't have to, we just need a function that gets us from what we think of versus what that market price is, right? That's the only function that we need. So what you need is essentially that's what you're, what you're saying is a targeted distribution. Yeah. We just need to know what the target is. We already know what it internally looks like. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of hands raised, uh, so I'm going to let them go next and then uh, we do still have some extra slides, but uh, let's see. It looks like SDG and E was up first, so I'll let you guys go ahead and ask your questions. Sorry about that. It took a, took a minute to get off off mute. Uh, well, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Pearson, uh, Director of Enterprise Risk. Not so much a question, but maybe a, just a point of perspective. Uh, we very much appreciate having the time to be able to talk about uh, risk scaling. Thanks in particular to Commissioner Reynolds' office, uh, ALJ Fogel, the staff of SPD and Energy Division for giving us this time. You know, my, my colleague mentioned back in technical working group number two, uh, the importance of tail risk and that for purposes of, of a, the beginning of our risk analysis, we look to avoid tail risk and, and topic events. And when uh, Vincent mentioned a minute, a minute ago, it was all about the tail risk, I couldn't help but to, to want to jump in. You know, risk attitude is, is an important part of the process for us, yes, but it needs to be looked at in concert with tail risk and risk tolerance. So for us, it's all about taking a look at what the, what's at the tail, making sure the different elements are included in there, uh, climate risk, for example, uh, disadvantaged communities and so on. And then deciding what risk consequences are, are just ones that we can't tolerate. So in tolerance, and then we apply risk attitude on top of that. So I guess what I'm saying is it's important for us to be able to have the flexibility to do the right thing for our business and to be able to use those. But as far as of the gas company, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Greg Flores from uh, SoCal Gas. You know, I just want to reemphasize what um, Scott Pearson just um, stated that, you know, the tail is an important consideration for um, all of us to uh, in our risk evaluation and the development of ensuring safe and reliable service. So we feel that it's an important aspect of our risk evaluation process and should be Consider as a part of the risk decision framework. So, um, I just want to emphasize that um, I'm in complete agreement with what uh, Scott Pearson has just stated. Great. Uh, I see that Dr. Eric Wojcik actually had his hand up, and then we'll uh, move on to to Brian Landry. Well, thank you. Uh, just a quick point. The discussion I think on market valuation, uh, to me, again emphasizes the concern that. Um, if when there's not data, when we can't find data, when we have these open tails, as as Dr. Mitchell said, uh, I think that to me is a, a process where then we're going to bias the entire analysis. We're going to be very prone to use this approach, or or we would use this approach when we have the data, but we won't use the approach when we don't have the data. And I think having the data, uh, going through that amount of data getting some verification of of the distribution is is going to be a very difficult in areas where we're we're new we're new at it what do we do it's not just fires there'll, there'll be other uh, approaches and then this is the bias towards certain mitigations and away from others that I I don't think we want to get into thank you okay great uh, uh 
Dr. Landry, actually. I should have. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, thanks, Eddie. So um, we just want to echo and support San Diego and Sempra's, um, you know, comments that they made there. We think that, you know, this cannot be um, sort of discussed nebulously without the context of risk tolerance. There are public policy objectives that, though we, we like to think they're risk neutral, they are not. Um, and we want to make sure that we understand this in the full context of all policy objectives of the state. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, I saw that there was a, a bit of discussion in the chat, um, but I think maybe it's uh, getting cleared up. Um, I don't know, Katie, did you, did you feel I, like- I don't know that it has been cleared up. I, I guess I, um, I think the thing that I would state is that from my perspective, um, the RDF is about providing information. It is about providing additional information to the commission and the types of information that is provided. There seems to be an unwillingness to provide certain information that um, I don't think, if the utility thinks that certain information doesn't reflect what they would like their um, mitigation portfolio to look like, they can provide additional information. We are asking for a minimum of information. Um, I, I still don't quite understand the suggestion that providing a minimum level of information is out of compliance with statutes. Um, Turn believes very strongly in the role of the CPUC in um, assessing utility proposals uh, for consistency with just and reasonable rates. And um, we are see simply seeking information provided consistent with that. I, I'm not trying to avoid a question. I, I think it's um, that is my response. It's it's an additional point of information. Okay, excellent. Um, Laura Earl, did did you have something to to add to that, uh, or because I, I believe part of that was in response to a question that you had asked in the chat. It was all in response to what I believe her question was, yeah. as I understood it after clarification. <laughs> well, well, and and actually, I don't know if uh, Katie or Dr. Feinstein, if you guys had any uh, additional uh, perspectives that you wanted to add uh, regarding, uh, you know, Vincent's presentation or the the approach that PG&E has discussed here. Um, I, you know, I think we are. I, I have been listening. Um, I think the my initial response, and and I look forward to potentially expanding on this in comments later, is that, you know, one of the goals from the get go of, um, the SMAP settlement now referred to as the RDF is, um, the goals of transparency, accountability, and participation. Um, and um, I have, I feel like this adds some complexity um, that would make it difficult for additional interveners to participate. Um, and that's just like an initial um, perspective. And um, I, we will definitely provide more um, in comments, I'm sure. Okay. Um, I do have- Perhaps I can, maybe I can respond to that a little bit. I just- sure. And I just want to mention that let's not confuse transparency with convenience with uh, simplistic approaches. You know, you can be transparent and we're fully prepared to be transparent. We're transparent in our last round. Fortunately, unfortunately, this is a complicated topic. And we want to simplify things as well. We, 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 we mentioned that we want to be, we want to use the risk neutral distribution, treat everything as risk neutral. But for us to do that, we need to move the distribution. See with the, what the market thinks, right? But we want to make it simple too. So let's let's just bear that in mind. Transparency as as uh, um, uh, there are many ways to be transparent. Okay. I'm going to move us uh, towards some of the additional discussion questions that uh, we had developed in the commission. Um, and I think the first, uh, some of the questions that that we've uh, that we were interested in asking have already been discussed. But I, I would like to hear 
I guess some some more pointed uh, responses to some of the questions that we're asking. Um, in particular, with regard to preferences, I, I believe to a certain extent we we do understand where PG&E uh, is coming from with regard to to risk preferences. Um, I, I guess the, the the one question that I have uh, in particular is. You know, whose risk preferences are not represented in the approach that PGE is taking. And, and Vincent, maybe you could start by uh, answering that, but I would actually like to hear from, from other interveners as well if they have any thoughts or concerns about whose risk preferences are not represented uh, through this approach, this market based approach. I think one of the things we, we make clear in, in our, our trade paper is that, for example, uh, the, the TBC communities, those, those are, I think, that economic comfort, external, external lab, externality, uh -huh. that are not captured in, 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 in the prices. We think they are. So, yeah, so those would not be re represented. So, I think that, that we'll probably, we would need to think and work through how we would incorporate ESJ concerns, DBC concerns, perhaps through the multipliers. Maybe there are other ways to do that. But, yeah, so I think that's some of the risk preferences that are. Oh, no. And j just so I can understand, I mean, Vincent, you've been talking about like, you know, um, that the risk preferences are, are somehow associated with this targeted distribution. So if, if you have already chosen a targeted distribution, couldn't you just uh, you know, target a different distribution that does incorporate the risk preferences that maybe are not found within the market? Yeah, 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 you could do that. Now, of course, we, the, the reason we chose the market distribution is because we wanted to be objective. We didn't want uh, you to come back and, and say, uh, you know, you, you PG and make this up. So we want it to be objective. And then we're thinking, you know, you start with the objective stuff first, what you know first, the economic factors, and then you layer in all the other priorities that you want to, to address. That's how we're thinking about it. But, you know, conceivably, there could be a different target. There could be other evidence out there besides market prices that says this is the kind of distribution we should be targeting. Okay. Um... Does any of the other interveners or uh, any anyone else on the line have any additional questions that they'd like to ask on this particular topic? Preferences. If not, actually, um, I. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Yeah, yeah. I I think the if one thing that uh, one risk that isn't being. Uh, accounted for is one we've raised in a number of filings now, and that is potential impacts of uh, cost increases on people who are at the very margin of affordability, uh, you know, at at or above, barely above the care level, where if you look at life expectancy curves. Uh, the amounts that people are paying now is enough to potentially make a measurable difference that's comparable to other risks. And uh, in order to do that right, it would take quite a bit of effort. Right now, you know, we have sort of, sort of just a proof of concept that that could be an effect. I think that needs to be taken into account somehow if we're doing a global cost benefit analysis. I think that's something we should that should be targeted to investigate in the future. Okay. So essentially, adding uh, in some way to to calculate the, the risk of affordability as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm going to to move on to the next slide. If there's uh, no additional questions. Um, so this, this slide was, uh, mainly to just, uh, try to understand if, uh, this market is really relevant to the type of, of risks and, and the general direction of the RDF in general. Um, in some ways, I think, uh, you, you know, Vincent, you've already answered some of these questions as they were posed by, by, uh, Dr. Feinstein. Um, but I do want to kind of push the question a little bit more about, um, you know, are there any inefficiencies within the cap bond market? Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else had the chance, but um, I had the opportunity to attend uh, the California um, 
Department of Insurance uh, just had their second workshop on the use of cap models uh, within the insurance market, which are not currently uh, regulated or they're not currently used within the, the, the state of California. And there is uh, a bit of concern amongst consumer uh, advocacy agencies that um, the cap modeling, uh, which also underlines some of the, the background behind the cap bonds and especially underlies the, the background of reinsurance, um, they definitely have biases. They have biases towards higher premiums. Uh, would you agree with that, uh, Vincent? And and if so, I, I, I'm not quite clear about how that affects uh, the pricing mechanisms that that are being discussed uh, in your proposal. Yeah, no doubt, right? Of course, the the, the sellers want a higher prices, but then the buyers have bias. The buyers have biases too. They have bias towards lower prices. And so we let the market do its thing. But but the uh, I guess the issue is it, uh, is the market efficiently doing that? Because it does seem that there's some concern amongst consumer advocacy groups that, that it, it's not efficiently uh, representing risk preferences. Yeah, I'm not I'm not um, um, I didn't attend the second workshop on insurance sure. uh, co commission, so I'm not sure exactly which issues they're pointing out. But I do know that you know the the markets are de dealing with um, the the residential markets are quite different from you know the the markets that that, that a corporation like PG&E would have to, to deal with. You know, uh, could we get better pricing? Of course, but you know um, that's something that's that's ongoing process. We work through it. We, we work with uh, brokers. We work with 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 our counterparties and we ask ourselves, you know, did we fully, you know, did we, did we, did we get a good enough participation on this, this kind of bond? There's something that we look at all the time. And one question I, I had for you uh, was you had mentioned that there was a, a third party who came in to help you in 2018 with your, uh, you know, cap on evaluation. Um, you know, I, I haven't read into to that uh, proceeding. I assume that it was part of the the, ER, uh, the, the GRC uh, from uh, perhaps 2020 or from the previous GRC. But, um, you know, the, when the, the reinsurance was involved in developing that, that cap bond, was all of the modeling uh, open and publicly available for us to, to view? Yes, I don't know about open and 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 um, I, I don't know if all of it was open, but they they did produce a report for us on on, and on the uh, assumptions they used and modeling techniques. I I don't know if you know we could actually run their code or something like that. I suspect yes. not, but so but they did provide you know like the assumptions that they were using and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that I guess that's my question is that some of the the modeling that's done behind the, the cap bonds is proprietary, correct? Yeah. Yep. Okay. But you know, it's not wouldn't be the first time right? we've dealt with many proprietary bonds bonds before. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Does anyone have any additional uh, questions? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, this slide was mainly uh, to just comment a little bit on um, pg es interpretation of, of our shift to the cost benefit approach that allows us to, to now compare across industries because, you know, uh, accordingly, this is all just supposedly money. Um, I would note that actually uh, in decision 22.12.027, the updated RDF framework, I don't believe uses the word prices, uh, it uses the word value. Um, and so there is that slight uh, difference. And I think there is a difference between prices and, and the values that uh, were intended for cost benefit approach. Uh, uh, but uh, I wanted to understand a little bit more, like, are there any assumptions that you, you need to make in order to connect the, the dollar value of uh, a cost benefit ratio in this proceeding or in, in a ramp filing and be able to compare it to, say, the insurance market and the prices that are being traded publicly on, on, a, on, on a bond market, on a cap bond market. So, so I hope, to, sorry we had so 
little time to go through the example, but I, I wanted to use that example to show you exactly what the assumptions we were making. But we can boil it down into a couple, right? Basically, uh, finance theory uh, and option valuation theory 101, um, you need a market and you need a riskless interest rate. So those are two assumptions just for theory. You need to build on top of that, you actually need to know what kind of market you have, like what bonds are you trading, so you can actually figure out the payout. And then you know you need to make some assumptions, like I mentioned. You need to make, you know, translate. And now, particular in that particular example, you need to translate from annual losses because that's the information we have. You need to make some transformation does into per event losses. So yeah, but in general, you know the, the most general set of assumptions are, are those basically a market, business rates, and you actually need to know the payout of whatever you're pricing. <laughs> You know, I, I'm just realizing that we're getting quite close to, to the 1230 mark. Um, I want to uh, open this up to the, the rest of uh, you know, our interveners here. We do have a couple of other additional slides that I do want to talk about. I could either push on because actually I'm assuming that we could probably get through it within the next 10 to 15 minutes, potentially, or we could uh, continue this discussion on uh, Friday and I think that it makes sense to continue the discussion on Friday if the other interveners or if other people uh, at the commission even, if they have additional questions that they would like to ask uh, before, uh, you know, during the Friday meeting. Um, otherwise, uh, I will continue with my slides today. Yeah, back then, If we decide to, to, to go on at this session, can I make a point about this slide? If, the, if nobody has their hand raised, then I'm going to keep going. Yeah, go ahead, Vincent. The, the point I wanted to make uh, when I first read this question, I was thinking, well, you know, insurance companies, the price, uh, they, 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 um, they, they, the coverage not just for for financial losses, it's for property losses, injuries, fatalities. So it's like at first I thought that was the question, but then you know it's like basically the question I think that you're asking is that. You know, these are just financial risks, you know, financial risks and not the same as the, the physical risk. Mm -hmm. But I think the point you want to bring out here, these all these things are relate, related, right? It's like, if you're not sure the tail of your financial risk, what makes you so sure that the tail of your physical equipment fatalities, reliability, what makes you so sure those are, those expectations are correct? What makes you so sure that you've got those tails correct when you don't even have your financial component to it, right? So these things are these things are all tied together. You can't just look at them one once separately and assume that oh this only applies to this area. You know that they, 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 they have this relationship. And so uh, I just want to make sure that I'm I'm hearing you clearly, Vincent. So that means that you're assuming that uh, the the tail end of a financial risk is less uncertain. It is more certain than the uh, tail end of a physical risk. Could be, yeah, yeah, could be, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it could be, or it is. I, I, I think that we think that 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 should be like a lower, that should be a, a lower limit, right? So it should, it, it, it should be, shouldn't be, shouldn't be any less than the financial uh, uncertainty that we have. Even though the, the financial risks are uh, actually just the result of the underwriting that comes from the distribution of the physical risks. Yeah, because we so 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 based on what you say, right? It's basically it should be tied together really close because it's. But if anything, it could it could be higher than 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 the uh, uh, um, underlying risk because you you don't really know you know how much if it's going to burn. You don't really know what are the true damages that are going to be caused. So yeah. All right, I'm going to keep uh, going on to some of the next uh, questions. Uh, this question, I, I believe that you've actually kind of clarified. It was actually one of the questions that we had uh, in reading your proposal that um, we weren't really sure if you were implying that, you know, financial products should stand in for, right, for physical. No, not at all. In fact, it's the opposite. It's like we want, we want the RDF to reflect the superior risk mitigation from from physical mitigations. But you know, short of us tying to, to, to market prices, we're not gonna get that. That was at least answered 
Fair enough, but um, uh, I, I guess then uh, you, what you're saying then is that uh, you know the the approach that you're suggesting it generates it's based off of the financial uh, impacts that you know the it's based off the financial attribute essentially, um, but you feel that it can be backed out and then applied to the safety and reliability attribute. Is that correct? Yeah, because most don't, of the don't. I mean, if we have more data on the physical, or we have more prices, I, I, I don't, you know, if we have other evidence, of course, we bring that into the concern uh, to 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 consider. But yeah, you know, the, what we apply on the financial side, you know, should 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 at least serve as the basis for what we're considering on on the physical fatality side, on the, the reliability side. Uh, Dr. Wojcik actually just uh, put in the chat that the physical risk may be less defined financial risk may be defined in more detail so the reverse of your point is possible but um actually 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 uh i, I worked in the physical electric markets and let me tell you the physical risk is way harder to, to manage because when you got to deliver a megawatt you got to deliver a megawatt when you got to deliver uh, gas you got to deliver gas you can't pay your way out of that you got to deliver it you know and that's that's how, you know. Although I, I used to work in the, the the oil industry, and it was like, if you gotta deliver a super tanker, you gotta deliver a super tanker. Okay, <laughs> but you can't pay your way out of that. <laughs> Although that that also raises my my concern about the inefficiencies of the market, because uh, that then implies that the market definitely always has a way to pay itself out of uh, you know. So, so if anything, yeah. If anything, the the market is just a lower 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 bounce, right? Sets a lower bounce on what it should be. Okay, I'm gonna uh, move on to to the next slide because I do feel that to a certain extent you've at least clarified this. Um, uh, unless there's any additional thoughts uh, about these particular questions. Yeah. I guess this, uh, this is just a, a follow up about the relevance. I mean, um, you know, uh, I guess the question is, is that why, why is it necessary to really embed, uh, you know, these, these financial losses, uh, and the, um, association with, with cap bonds and, and reinsurance within the risk assessment fate, you know, the risk assessment part of this, uh, you know, this this uh, this proceeding, because c c doesn't the don't the utilities if they are uh, you know issuing cap bonds, doesn't that already address this risk? And by embedding it within the risk assessment, does it have the potential to kind of essentially double count the risk? No, so 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 it's not it's not about the physical. It's not about the. The, 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 it's not so much about, you know, doing this mitigation on, on not what doing that mitigation is, is how do we assess the mitigations consistently? So when you do that cat bond deal, somebody does a cat bond deal, and using that cat bond deal, it's like basically when we transacted that, that deal, you can back out the distribution that you were using that intuitively the parties were agreed to use when they did that transaction. And we're saying basically that piece of information should be carried uh, uh, forward in all your other decision making. Should be consistent with all your other decision making. I'm not saying we need to put on the same uh, edge edge twice. Just saying that whatever assumptions you used when you did your financial stuff, or vice versa, the other way around, whatever that you use in one area, that those assumptions need to be inferred. You need to infer, you know, all the preferences that went into that assumption. You can infer those out and use those consistently. It, but it, if you if you purchase uh, or if you issue a cap bond and you've essentially hedged the risk, the financial risk, um, would that then affect uh, all of your risks? Because essentially you've hedged it, so therefore your financial risk, your total financial risk, is lower. Isn't there a feedback? Uh, into per, into issuing a, a type of a cap bond or a hedge, uh, you know, some type of a, of a reinsurance per, purchasing a reinsurance policy. So, once again, those things just kind of compensate you for the the risk, right? They don't really lower the 
That's right. The real, the real risk. Like so, like in in a sense, they give you some. They'll give you information about um, the the market assessment of the tails. They'll give you information about how under how we're under biasing the tails, and we can use that information uh, as we think about the real mitigations that we need to put in place. Uh, I, Go ahead. No, I I I hope that answers answers your question. I'm, I'm, I I. I, it's like, yeah, you can put on all these, and we do, we do, we do have insurance for all this, this stuff. We do have insurance, we do have welfare insurance, we, we have all these programs, but that doesn't mean we, 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 we're stopping from, we, we stop from doing the physical mitigations, right? Yeah. We're just saying that we want to make them consistent. So does that mean that, okay. valuation consistent? That, that's a great example. Then. So do your insurance purchases that, that the PG and uh, invests in, does that affect your risk scores, any of your risk scores? Uh, financial or no, you don't incorporate that into into your risk scores. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me move on from this one. This was a, a part that I, to a certain extent, I think you've kind of explained a little bit more clearly than than the way that it was presented in the the proposal. It, you made it sound like, you know, if if. If the market based approach isn't integrated into the, the RDF, that it makes the RDF irrelevant. Could you just clarify why, why would that make it irrelevant? Yeah, okay. So, so basically, if you uh, go back to that spreadsheet example, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. The spreadsheet example, I guess you would look at that bottom left number, right? Um, that, that over there, yeah. See those two numbers there? So basically, we're saying, we're saying, uh, one thing is, let's say you do a physical mitigation and you decide to use the expected value. Okay, and you did the physical mitigation. Um, you can reduce the risk by 10%. You should have a 10%. Uh, uh, value I just uh, attached to it. So, underlying uh, wildfire loss is $42 million, 10%, $4.2 million. Now, you can you can conceivably create a financial product around this loss sharing okay. uh, agreement or some sum of money, some certainty equivalent sum of money. Uh, you counterparty take 10% uh, of the losses that will face. Now, based on the distribution that you back out, you would say that this thing had $93 million times 10%, $9 million value. Why should these two things have different value? And the same, same thing. In fact, the, the mitigation, the fiscal mitigation, probably is a superior product. We all agree to that. Why, why do we have two different, why do we have two different numbers? Right? We're not going to change the prices. We're not going to change the prices from the, from the market transactions, those prices are those prices. That's so like we're, 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 we we are we are going to be undervaluing our mitigations. And why are we undervaluing our mitigations? Because if you if you live in a fat tail environment, what I said earlier, you live in the fat tail environment. All the all the all the observations you see are underbiased. You never see the catastrophic stuff until it's too late. So 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 so. You, you're going to be undervaluing the risk. You know, that's true. I did notice that uh, Dr. Wojciech uh, asked a question. I'm sorry, I missed that. It was uh, where is physical for the Northeast blackout or hurricane? I, I'm I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm only saying that physical. You can do all the physical calcs you want, but the financial doesn't necessarily track the, the, the physical and the financial can be more complete than the physical. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vincent, if you didn't have any additional thoughts on that, the, um, I, I do have one question that I was hoping that you could clarify is just that, um, you know, you've, you've talked about how the market helps us understand, you know, this, the, the fat tail, it helps us understand the, the fat tail inside, um, you know, certain environments. In, in Dr. Mitchell's proposal, 
he was discussing the use of power law to address exactly that fat tail environment that you're discussing. So uh, could, could you explain, I mean, you've, you've explained, I guess, the, 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 the differences between the two, and actually you've mentioned that they're, they're actually fairly similar, in fact, actually. The, the final slide of your presentation essentially argues that a certain tweak to the way that you, uh, you know, utilize market pricing demonstrates a power law, if I'm not mistaken. So, so now that, let's go back to that slide. So I just wanted to mention that 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 um, that, that was a, a great article. That's our discussion all, all great. And actually, you're thinking a lot about stuff. So it's all very good. But basically, what this slide was saying is basically, um, here's a way using the risk given function, you can reflect that belief that belief that that. Uh, these risk type of power law distribution. You can go from one distribution, whatever it is, you can start with your underlying distribution, whatever it is, a very general formula. But you can go with that, that, that underlying distribution and you can transform it into a power law distribution. So this slide basically says this is a cumulative dis density distribution function, cumulative dis distribution function. Basically, you start with the X uh, there on the, uh, the X axis, you see the X value. You find out what the equivalent probability is. So that's you got that blue arrow and then you go left to that blue arrow. And then you bounce back to say, oh, that's what that probability is on this distribution, the original distribution. And you bounce back to that follow the yellow arrow and you end up with what would that equivalent value of X be on the power distribution. So basically that's a way to go from one, any general distribution to to the distribution to a power law distribution to reflect your view that our view that the uh, your view that the power law distribution uh, is is how this risk uh, looks like right so and the thing that I think is interesting is that you can use the market prices to calibrate that power law distribution originally if, uh, if you remember in our paper our white paper on the power law uh, and Dr Mitchell's comments it's like yeah, how do we cal calibrate the power of distribution? Because it has an infinite mean. You know, it's like we got to truncate it somehow. So, uh, you know, what we did in our in our uh, in our power implementation, we assumed some magnitude of losses. But here's another method to do that. Just go uh, use uh, what the, the the market information and and back out the parameters that lead to that 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 price. And then, uh, with that in mind. Uh... Uh, you could actually just use market prices to calibrate the power law. Uh, there's no actual need to to create a second uh, risk scale, essentially. Yeah. I mean, you you could do that. I thought about that. Too. I thought about that. I thought about that. I wanted you to do that. But I think there's some there's some there's some uh, relevance in, in doing it this way. There's some there's some good reasons to do it this way. First of all, the data is a lot of the data that we have. You know, is, is is when and when we manage this risk, they're, they're based on the physical attributes. Right? We want to manage CMI, we want to manage uh, uh, fatalities, we want to manage those. So operationally, those are the numbers we want to manage. Too. Those are the distribution we want to manage. Too. So asking somebody to manage the power law distribution for, for for monetize, you know, it's like no, we want to be able to look at the data. Uh, in its in its original uh, manner and manage to those natural units. So I think I think that's why that's why uh, you know we want to be able to to do this. But in in effect, you're right. You just start with power distribution at the beginning. Just tell it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Ooh, I don't want to send an email to Yumi. <laughs> okay. Any question. Yeah, uh, there is, I believe, uh, a couple other questions, uh, mainly it, it's for the other IOUs. I would just like to hear from SE and Semper very quickly if they, uh, you know, if they agree with the approach that's laid out by PG&E uh, or if they have any suggested modifications uh, to the approach that PG&E has, has presented. Um, so I don't know if um, uh, the folks from SDG and E, who spoke earlier, if you had any additional thoughts that you'd like to include, or if Brian, if you'd like to speak up.
Okay. If you do, please raise your hand. Um, and then I'll I'll put the kind of a similar question, uh, or maybe the reverse to, to any of the interveners. I mean, uh, Dr. Wojcik and um, uh, Dr. Mitchell, you, you both, and, and uh, Dr. Feinstein have provided some great uh, questions uh, today. I just wanted to know, like, um, are there, you know, any particular implications that PG&E's approach has for the selection of mitigations in, in you know, the future ramp and GRC filings? Do you, do you have any thoughts on that in particular that you'd like to to discuss uh, as we kind of close out here? And, and do you feel that it improves on the transparency uh, of, the G, of the RDF? I've taken everybody away from their lunch, sorry. Hi, uh, this is Eric Wojcik, just real quick. I, I, I'll just restate, pardon me, a, a point that I'm worried that when you have data, um, it'll be very useful to use this approach where you don't have data, it will not, and it will bias what we use and define as metrics uh, in the process. So I'm worried that it's gonna be very hard to verify and or to get some clear or comfortable um, uh, view of particular distributions. And if we can't do that, uh, and you can get clarity on other distributions, um, then we're going to have a very, I think, messy uh, a business of trying to select and use uh, these kinds of approaches in a best of all possible worlds in a more um, liquid set of markets. Great, but these are not liquid markets. These are uh, with with almost have some of these pieces have no liquidity. Thanks. Okay, Katie, I saw that you had your video up for a second if you still wanted to. I was just going to say we don't. Um, we're we're still taking it all in, and and we'll have comments when we file comments. I, I don't know that I have more to add now. No, that's okay. Uh, then um, that that's helpful for uh, thinking about um, follow up to this as well. Um, okay, um, I see Mike Schneider and yeah, I, Eddie. I'm sorry. I've I've been viewing. Uh... In the background, I, I'm the chief risk officer for SDG&E, and okay. I did want to at least uh, weigh in a little bit on your question so that we didn't leave silence on, on the workshop. And I really appreciate the, uh, the overviews of the folks here. And Vincent, thanks for going through the risk scaling, and we've had chances to, to get a sense of it over the last few months and really appreciate PG&E trying to move forward um, on this journey. I, I do want to at least go on the record here at this workshop of saying we're still evaluating PG&E's approach. I, I appreciate and actually kind of agree with the Dr. Wojcik on the data side of it, that we've got to make sure we've got good data um, that really represents how we operate our businesses. As we look at risk scaling, I think there's a lot of, of benefit to, to looking at factors that, that go in, particularly areas where we can sync up with power law. But we've got to make sure that uh, we're addressing all types of risks um, and, and risks that in many cases are the ones that we spend most of our dollars addressing. Um, and um, from our standpoint, bringing in some different industry perspectives and some experiences into the analysis would make a lot of sense to us to evaluate the risk uh, uh, approach that PG&E's brought forward. Um, we've got some examples within petroleum, within nuclear, aviation, et cetera, that tie very closely to our safety management system. And we want to stay and we want to stay consistent with all of those factors. We don't want to get out of sync by using something that might miss a mark here. So I just want to be on the record for saying that. I think we've got some additional work in this area. I know we have an opportunity in December if the commission so chooses to come back together. And I would like to commit that we could come forward um, and provide some additional insights uh, to maybe respond to both of the approaches today, as well as unpack the tail risk issue a little more specifically. Because I think that that is going to be very informative and if we can do it in a way 
that deals with tr transparency issue because the worst thing we can do is just get into a mathematical sort of debate, but really focus in on transparency here. I think it will inform parties well. So I just wanted to go on the record for saying that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, Vincent, you have your hand up, so I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Dr. Weichel's comment about, uh, you know, not having enough uh, data. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, you need to make sure that, once again, it's an evidence-based approach. We need to show the evidence. But one thing to mention is that, you know, what is the, what is the data that we have to, uh, to assume a risk-neutral profile, right? It's like, in fact, all the data that I've shown you, you can, you can look in the bond directory. All the data I can mention, or virtually all of it, shows that the the uh, the, the 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 markets are not not risk neutral. So it's like, yeah, you know, we we, we definitely need to consider the, the the evidence, all of the evidence. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that the the hands that are up are just left over from Mike Schneider. Um, I don't see any additional hands up. I think I'm going to roll this out. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody being willing to, um, you know, stay a little bit extra. I apologize that it went longer. Um, I feel that this was, uh, you know, a complex discussion. PG&E presented something that um, is new, and I think everybody is digesting, uh, which I think is evident. Uh, and so uh, I think it required some additional uh, Critical questions to just make sure that we were all on the same page and understanding where the proposal was coming from and, and what the implications are of it. Um, so I appreciate Vincent, your uh, patient answering of, of these questions and the next steps are that, um, as always, there's going to be a, a recording uh, of this that comes out in the coming days, about 3 to 4 days, and it'll be up on the YouTube site. Um, <laughs> Turn and PG&E are not going to file climate change proposals. Sorry about that. I'll change that before it goes up, uh, before the final slides go up. Uh, they're going to be filing risk scaling uh, proposals. Uh, and uh, the first uh, filing will happen on October 12th. Um, there's going to be ruling questions for party comment that uh, come out approximately on uh, October 16th. Um, uh, yeah, the workshop for opening comments will come out then uh, November 6th and workshop for reply comments will come out uh, on November 13th. And again, I just remind you that we, we will have uh, another uh, workshop on uh, discount rates and uh, reporting templates uh, that are going that's going to happen on October 25th. Uh, so our series is still continuing and um, there's still discussions to, to have uh, on in this month, in October 25th. So um, I think I'll probably wrap us up as long as there's no uh, final thoughts or questions from anyone. Um, I don't know if Jake is still in the, the room and if he had any final thoughts uh, that he wanted to share, I'm not sure he is. Uh, or if uh, Judge Lakey, if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to share. No final thoughts for me, thank you. Okay, great. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate again that everybody's staying late and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next workshop. Thank you. And I'll just emphasize that uh, I don't believe that we need, since no one has, has, has requested it, I don't believe that we will need to continue the discussion on, on Friday. So uh, we will just uh, leave this discussion as it, as it was today. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. chat.